The science of longevity is a hot topic right now, not least because Chris Hemsworth just made a flashy documentary all about it on Disney+. Plus. But when the media tend to report on longevity science, they normally sell it as a way to make humans live to 200 or something equally sci-fi. And it inevitably gets wrapped up in the image of billionaires funding research to keep them alive forever. And honestly, that was my initial knee-jerk response to hearing about it a while ago as well. So if that's how you feel, you're far from from alone. But please do keep watching because for me, one book in particular really changed my mind about this whole field and that was Ageless by Andrew Steele. And luckily, Andrew is a friend. So I invited him over to chat all about the field. This is a really fascinating conversation about why we should be interested, all of us, in longevity research, because it isn't just about making rich people live longer. It's about making all of us live healthier lives and avoiding premature death. We cover loads of ground from the science to policy to overpopulation, all of it. And as this is a long conversation, you might prefer to listen to this as a podcast, in which case, just close your eyes. Actually, that's a lie. I left the joke in because I kind of like it, but I have indeed decided to make this available as a podcast. I've been making quite a few long videos recently, which I enjoy doing. It kind of takes me back to my journalism roots, but quite a few of you have asked for this, so I have created the Medlife Crisis podcast, which I have provisionally called Still Practicing, it's kind of kind of a joke. I'll work on them. And um, it's for the time being, it's just a kind of placeholder. It's going to be just the audio of my longer videos where, to be honest, the main thing you're missing out on is my face. So you could legitimately argue it's a marked improvement. But anyway, hopefully by the time this goes up, it should be live in all the usual podcast places. And who knows, in time, I do hope to make it into a thing in itself. But for the time being, it's, it's just going to be the long videos that you can listen to. But apart from further confusing the facial hair continuity in this video, I wanted to pop up now to quickly share something even more exciting with you. Some of you might know that I've been building a streaming platform with a bunch of friends since its inception, and it's going to be a major focus for me going forwards from, from now on. It's called Nebula, and it's a very ambitious project, and so far I am just really loving working on it and being involved. It's a place where you can find exclusive content from me and hundreds of other creators. So, every video I release will go up on Nebula first, by a good chunk of time. You'll be able to watch my next video, which is another deep dive, this time into the placebo effect, well before YouTube. And I'm going to be making more videos specifically designed to have a home on Nebula, where, of course, I'm protected from the demonetization and restriction that has hit many of my videos, wherever I talk about or show medical images, when I've talked about death, surgery, things like the Holocaust, and uh, sort of grim topics, and many more. There are already hundreds of originals and exclusives for you to check out, and the roster of creators is unbelievable. I'm really proud of what we have built, from Johnny Harris to Real Life Law, Wendover Productions to Lindsay Ellis. Follow the link below to sign up via my channel so that the uh, the big boys and girls can see that I am helping in my small way. But, you know, the whole idea behind Nebula is that it's a way that you can watch all of this amazing content, but also directly support creators whose videos you enjoy. I've never really been comfortable with the idea of direct donation because I can go months at a time without releasing anything. But now think of this as a way to support me. So any help is hugely appreciated, but you also get access to all these other superstars as well. If you sign up using my link, then you will get $10 off the annual price, meaning it'll cost you just $3.33 per month for all of that content and the best way to support your favorite creators. But now, sit back and enjoy this honestly mind-bending conversation with the extremely knowledgeable and entertaining Dr. Andrew Steele. Welcome, everybody. Today, I have a very special guest. In fact, the first guest to ever come to my ramshackle, half-finished studio all the way out in Essex. He's travelled half the way across England to get here. So I'm very grateful to Dr. Andrew Steele, who is initially... Well, I'll let you tell your, your story because it's very interesting. But we're going to talk today all about the science of ageing. And this, Andrew, is not a softball Russell Howard... <laughs> show interview where they're just gonna serve up easy questions for you 
this is not uh, your your opportunity, to, uh, like in the Royal Institution talk, to just uh, speak without any questioning at all. Today, you're going to face some tough questions, and I'm, I'm going to challenge some of the uh, the science of aging. I mean, there's plenty to challenge, so be my guest. Oh, okay, you're supposed to be more adversarial here. Oh, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Am I supposed to cower a bit? Would that help? No, no, like uh, we want a bit of drama. Oh, I see. So aging is, it's everything you've heard is completely legit. There's no uh, and, nonsense and bullshit science forever. in this. I think, I mean, forever is the word I, I preferentially use in interviews. Excellent. If people mention immortality, I love it. Exactly. So this man <laughs> alleges that we can all become immortal. But before we get to that, why don't we start with, obviously, thank you for coming, Andrew. Um, thank you for having me. That, that's ruined the adversarial nature. Hasn't oh. it? Um, <laughs> let's start with why you got into this field. I, I know you talk about a, a special graph, which I think is a nice story. So why don't we do that? Yeah, so I started out actually as a physicist, which I guess is probably the reason that I could change career because of a graph, like that background. Um, and it was toward the end of my PhD, I started reading a bit about aging biology. And the graph I saw was the graph of your risk of death based on how old you are. Now, all of us know that older people are more likely to die, but just how much really shocked me. So we're both in our 30s, and that means our risk of death every year is probably about one in a thousand. And I quite like those odds, because if that were to continue for the rest of our lives, we'd live into our thousand and thirties on average. However, unfortunately, that doesn't continue. Your risk of death doubles about every eight years as a human. And what that means is that if we're lucky enough to make it into our 90s and unlucky enough that medical technology doesn't advance in the intervening time, we'll have a one in six chance of death every year. That's life and death at the roll of a dice. And you look at that as a physicist and you think, what is this sort of universal ticking clock that's going mm. on inside all of our bodies? And what's really fascinating, that, you know, that word universal, um, because if, I were to, if you were to find me some undiscovered tribe in the Amazon rainforest, I wouldn't be able to tell you very much about them. I'm not an anthropologist. But what I could tell you is their mortality rate doubling time, as it's called, would be eight years. Their risk of death would double every eight years, just like you and I. And that seems to be a fundamental fact about being human. And so, you know, you look at that as a physicist, the, the arrogance that comes with that field, and you think, well, if there's this incredibly universal trend, there must be something going on. Maybe we can study it. Maybe we can intervene in it and, you know, potentially help people with what's the world's biggest cause of death and the world's biggest cause, I would contend, of suffering as well. Yeah. So let's let's sort of unpack that. When you say the world's biggest cause of death, you know, most people will think they'll look that up. They'll Google that. It'll, it'll come out as cardiovascular disease and uh, cancer and, and uh, dementia and things like that. So what do you mean when you say ageing is the biggest cause of death? Well, let's get medical jargon. This is the right place to do that, I guess. Um, ageing is the world's biggest risk factor. Mm. So, you know, you and I, we, you know, we could smoke, we could drink, we could, you know, abandon whatever healthy lifestyles we're attempting to lead and become the least healthy possible examples of people in our late 30s. Nonetheless, our risk of death would still be dwarfed by the risk of death of the cleanest living 80-year-old who's had the best possible life. What that means is merely the fact of getting older makes you so much more susceptible to the cancer, the heart disease, the stroke, the Alzheimer's, all of these diseases that are the world's biggest killers. The biology that causes them is the biology that happens to all of us you know, every day of our lives, not even of our lives, every day since conception. These processes have been going on inside and outside your cells that make these diseases much more likely. And if you sort of group all those things together, we call that the aging process, then that is responsible, if you do the maths, for about two thirds of deaths around the world. OK, so I'll grant you that, that um, there is clearly a common factor and it. Absolutely, it is the, the biggest risk factor for, for many of these conditions. And we've seen this again mirrored with, with COVID very dramatically. Um, and this is one of the jokes I make to patients sometimes. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an insight into the, the repartee that I, I uh, crack. Um, when patients have, say, a very slow heart rate, which isn't something caused by the usual um, kind of risk factors for, for heart disease like smoking and cholesterol, a lot of the time it is purely an aging process. So they'll say, is this something that I've done, doctor? And I'll say, that's just too many birthdays. And um, this is very much an accepted concept, right? That, you know, we slow down, things start working less well as we get old. Um, but you're saying that this is actually should be considered itself like a disease process. But what is ageing then? I mean, is it, it, it seems like a very vague concept overall. Is it a nebulous combination of different things or is it sort of one biological process that's happening? That is a good question. And I think it's 
there are multiple ways that you can answer that. Like the, the simplest definition of aging is it's that statistical change in your risk of death. And humans, our mortality rate doubling time is eight years. For a mouse, it's a few months. For some animals, actually, it's infinite. They don't have a risk of death yeah, that changes so, with so, time. Just, so why don't you explain that? Because that's really so. There's a, there's this phrase negligible senescence, which is mm. a, a whole bunch of jargon. Negligible obviously just means not very much. Senescence is just this sort of biological term for aging. And there are some animals like tortoises, like some kinds of fish, whose risk of death doesn't change depending on how long ago they were born. They become adults and they have the same sort of constant risk of death throughout their lives they do eventually die of course because that risk of death isn't zero but it appears that they don't age by this statistical definition so that's sort of the simplest way to think about aging the question of whether or not it's a disease or a disease process or perhaps a syndrome i don't really like any of these words mainly for actually a sociological reason which is that i don't want to you know some 60 year old comes and starts chatting to me i don't want to be like sorry love you're diseased just by the fact that you've been on this earth for 59 years or whatever that might be sure so i'm not really keen on that phrase whether or not it's a single process um let's 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 argue that it is for a moment mm -hmm. the one way you could look at it is there are single interventions you can do that slow down seemingly the whole of this process. And sort of the classic example of this is calorie restriction. So we don't know exactly whether or not this works in humans. That's another discussion that we can park for a moment. But in all kinds of different animals, and this was first discovered in the 1930s in rats, you can feed them dramatically less and they'll live dramatically longer. And they won't just sort of be hobbling along, frail, you know, unable to even summon the energy to die because they're eating so little. They actually, you know, get, they get less cancer, they get less heart disease. These diseases are pushed back until later in life. So it really does seem as though you're actually slowing down the aging process by doing that. On the other side of the coin, things like smoking, things like, you know, uh, eating badly, things like not getting enough exercise, although they do affect certain parts of the body more and certain parts of the body less, ultimately the sort of wide effects of these are a sort of generalised increase in the ageing process. So smoking doesn't just damage your lungs, it can cause cancers elsewhere in the body, it can cause heart disease, which aren't directly necessarily caused by the cigarette smoke going into your lungs, it's caused by the inflammation, the other yeah, ageing related sure. processes that are going on. So that's the sort of argument that it is one thing. But in my book, <laughs> in my book, I break it down into 10 what are called hallmarks of the aging process. And these are the biological sort of things that are going on under the hood. And in that respect, I don't think it is easy to argue that it's one process. The challenge is that, you know, you, you can enumerate it in this list of 10 things. Mm. Uh, we can talk more about those in a bit. But although we've got this list of 10 things, and I think it's a really good starting point to understand and to begin to develop therapies for sort of aging as a, as a process. Actually, they are, you know, they are quite different. But they're also very interlinked. So, you know, some cause others and then they can have these feedbacks where something causes something else, which then goes back to worse than the original hallmark and so on and so on. So it's, it sort of becomes a definitional question. But operationally, there are things that we can do where you give someone a drug or you know get a mouse to eat less or there are a variety of different ways you can do it, which seem to slow down at least most of, maybe even the whole of the ageing process. So I've sort of weaseled my eye out of that by saying both, haven't I? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I just... I, I totally understand that there ultimately it doesn't necessarily matter. We still want to address these problems. But I think I just wanted to push back slightly gently on that because, you know, for the same reason when public campaigns for a cure for cancer um, in medical circles, we kind of regard those as being a little kind of nonsensical because there is no one cancer. Mm. So, you know, different cancers have very different challenges. And I think in a similar sort of way, um, trying to have a cure for aging or trying to, to address aging actually can involve many, many different, you know, uh, elements. So, yeah, I think that's probably not that important, but, but um, it, it's some, certainly something that when I read some of the, and we'll talk about this as well, the hype in the mm -hmm. field, it does feel like it's just this one monumental thing. Um, but... You mentioned the 10 kind of points w which you've broken down aging into. Um, I don't know if you can list all 10 uh, off the top of your head. It's like the seven <laughs> deadly sins. The one I forget is the one that's going to kill me. <laughs> but but there are a few that I want to explore in particular. I'll put a, I'll put a list up on the screen. Of, of Save all us 10. all the embarrassment. <laughs> exactly. And I'll, I'll put the graph as well earlier. But uh, there are a few that I wanted to, to, to really concentrate on. So I'll start with uh, senescent cells. Um, so what's the concept there? And this is fantastically fortunate for anyone talking about aging because it's, it's the easiest to understand and it's the one where the treatments are arguably the most advanced. So senescent, we've already come across that word. It's just the biological word for aging. And these were originally discovered because when you put a cell in a dish and let it divide, it can only divide a certain limited number of times. And in human cells, that's about 50. And then these, these cells, they enter this really strange state 
And it's, I, I'm not a microscopist, I'm not a cell biology expert at all, but even I can see there's something wrong with these cells. They go from this sort of lovely round shape to this weird, sometimes called the fried egg phenotype. They just sort of look like they're splatted out on the plate. Mm. But more importantly than how weird they look, they stop dividing. And that means that obviously a lot of places in our body, it's really important that the cells are dividing. Like our skin is constantly refreshing, the lines of our guts are constantly refreshing. And so if cells stop dividing, they're not fulfilling their function. And actually, it turns out this isn't just a process that happens in cells in a dish. It's something that happens in, in animals, in humans as well. We accumulate these aged senescent cells as we get older. And they appear to also be causal in the aging process. So the more of these cells you have, the more likely you are to get various diseases. And by clearing those cells out, that's the sort of really exciting part. You seem to be able to slow down, maybe even reverse aspects of aging. So, so that last bit that you said there suggests that this is not this is there is a causal link here. This is not just a byproduct that we're seeing and actually removing the senescent cells has an effect. Yeah, and that's what's really exciting. And so I, I'm, I'm pretty happy to say that like in mice, it seems to reverse how old they are. Yeah. So they've done an experiment in 2018. They gave some 24-month-old mice. Obviously, mice live a lot less long than we do. That's probably like 60 or 70 years mm -hmm. old in human terms. They gave them this cocktail of drugs that kills their senescent cells. And these mice... The reason I'm happy to say they got biologically younger, they lived longer. But again, like calorie restricted mice, they were living longer in good health. They got less cancer, they got less heart disease, they got fewer cataracts, they're less frail, so they've got tiny little mouse-sized treadmills in these experiments and they yeah. run further and faster yeah, you, on you, those. You've featured some of these these clips and the, the pictures, and even to an untrained eye, it's it's apparent. It's really remarkable. Yeah. Again, yeah, I've, I've never actually you know played with a mouse in the lab, but you can see that, I mean, that's the other thing. They just look fantastic. Mm. And, you know, people are obviously very worried about the cosmetic aspect. good-looking mouse. Yeah, yeah. That you, can, you can see it's got thicker fur, it's got less grey fur, for, like even if you don't care about the health of your insides just purely from a cosmetic standpoint they look fantastic yeah well that's that's the way to tell this stuff isn't <laughs> really it? it's, it's just to tell some billionaires that they can look great i remember chatting to one of the people i interviewed for the book who was working on um the elasticity of blood vessels and how that might change because mm. of alterations to the proteins yeah and she was like if i can fix the collagen anywhere in the body i'd like to fix the collagen that holds your blood vessels together because that's one of the things that causes high blood pressure that causes heart disease mm. but you might find because the processes involved are very similar people start taking these pills and they get sort of lovely fresh rejuvenated looking skin and maybe you'll have people popping into their doctor like asking for these things or you know that there are some treatments being trialed for arthritis where you're going to get, oh, my knee's really quite painful, purely because you want the cosmetic side effects, because that's what's so exciting about some of this stuff. Well, you're, you're not advocating I'm this. I'm absolutely not advocating for this. No, but I, I think what, what this shows Don't, us is... Definitely do not do this. <laughs> I think what's what's really exciting about this is that the, because you can see this really obvious external sign, it shows us that there is, you know, I, my, my long sort of rambling answer about whether or not ageing was a process. Mm. It clearly is a process to some extent. If, if a drug that's been given, you know, to, to remove these aged cells not only has effects on the heart, but also has effects on the skin, that's just a fantastic demonstration that ageing is on some level, at, you know, in some aspects, coherent. Yeah. And so senescent cells seems to be a, a promising target and, and these are just everywhere in the body are there or, or, or where, where does one how does one target these it's a very good question and actually i think that's one of the sort of weakest points of the field at the moment so there are various ways you can look for senescent cells by which genes they're using because mm -hmm. the way that what, what often happens to a cell in fact what happens to most cells in your body if they enter the if they've divided too many times which is one of these i said reasons it can become senescent mm -hmm. or if they get damaged to their dna so they're looking like they might be turning into a cancer cell actually what a lot of cells do in that situation is they uh, commit apoptosis Yep. which is just this natural form of cell death the cell just basically disintegrates and that's the end of it so this senescent state they try and kill themselves but for some reason various genes come on that effectively stop that suicide cascade and they just sit there and so people have tried to identify what those genes are and target cells with those genes or that, that are using those genes i should say the trouble is it's not just senescent cells because obviously genes have loads and loads of different functions so if you kill all the cells in the body that are expressing there's one gene called p16 which is quite often used for this um you're probably not just targeting senescent cells and so the real challenge actually there isn't a fully formally accepted definition which means it's very hard to count these things mm -hmm. and what's really frustrating and this is true in a lot of aging research is you know, it might be that certain people get a lot more senescent cells in their liver and other people with a different lifestyle or a different genetic background get a lot of senescent cells in their kidneys or, or whatever it might be. Right. And we just haven't got the data at the moment. And, I, you know, I really hope that that data collection effort is ongoing alongside the sort of rush to turn these things into drugs. Is, is there much human data 
for, for this at all? So there are a few, or there, there are 20 or 30 companies currently trying to commercialize this and mm-hmm. quite a few of them have already launched human trials. They're all in the sort of phase one, phase two, checking, you know, does it kill people? Thankfully not so far, you know, safety sort of side of things rather than actually working out whether or not they work. Okay. But it's definitely, you know. Should coming... I invest? <laughs> Great question. Well, if you watch the history of Unity Biotechnology, which is one of the biggest ones, their share price has been dwindling over the last few years. Oh, and it's, it's, okay. it's, it's really fascinating trying to like work out as a, I'm not an investing expert at all, so no, this is not investment this advice. This is not financial advice. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just sort of trying to work out, sometimes they can announce a really positive sounding trial result. I'm always very preliminary. It's not as though these things are rolling out into the clinic you know, next year or anything like that. But they announce a positive result, but seemingly it wasn't positive enough for the market and the share price actually goes down. Wow, so it's, it's really, really hard as yeah. a sort of you've got to be an expert not only in the biology but also in the sort of investing side of this it's a it's a huge market opportunity i can see why investors are interested but yeah it's a it's a risky place to put your money as a as an individual i would say yeah i mean (laughs) um you know viewers of the channel who've who've watched me before might be surprised that i'm slightly cynical no that you wouldn't be surprised at all uh, (laughs) about uh, some of these these companies um so that's senescent cells then i think one that people have heard a lot about before is telomeres um so these are essentially the little end well it's from the the greek telos meaning end and check you out with your classical education yeah, always you've got to get the the etymology in so yes telomeres i think people have heard of they're they're well why don't you tell us what they are yeah actually there's a connection to the senescent cells so the way in which a cell counts off how many times it's divided is that every time a cell divides it loses a tiny bit of this telomere at the end of its yeah. dna and this is you know, it's, it's actually a bit bizarre because the reason this happens is that biology has happened across uh, an enzyme, which is the thing that goes along and duplicates the DNA when the cell divides, so has to have a copy in each daughter cell. It duplicates that DNA, but it can't quite make it to the end. And the best analogy I've heard is that it's like, imagine a builder, she's going on the top of a wall, trying to build the wall as she goes, but she's then standing in the place so she can't place that final brick. Mm. And so what that means is that this these things start out like a few thousand or maybe 20,000 base pairs long when you're born to so 20,000 DNA letters and you lose perhaps 20 of those a year on average mm. and perhaps every time a cell divides you lose 100 or you know so it's, it, they're, they're gradually getting shorter and shorter throughout your life yeah and um what that means is you know maybe this is a candidate course for aging it's something that changes as you get older and so you can look at the sort of observational data this is where we just get some people in the public, you know, yeah. find out how long their telomeres are and see what happens to them. And people with shorter telomeres tend to die sooner. They tend to get diseases more quickly. There are some very morbid twin studies where they find that the twin who has the shorter telomeres tends to die before the twin of the longer telomeres. That's um, very interesting. But yeah. the problem with them as a sort of measure of aging is it's really, really noisy. If you look at some of the raw data, mm-hmm. you have some 20-year-olds who have telomeres the same length as the 90-year-olds have mm-hmm. the longest telomeres. That's I, sort of... I was surprised when you, you showed that um, like scatter plot because mm-hmm. the, the, the trend was not that strong the no. correlation um so that's interesting because uh, the 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 teaching i'd got about it uh, the analogy that I, i'd been told was the, the little bit at the end of your shoelace mm. you probably heard that one as well um it's the reason i know the word aglet that's what they're called is that what they're called yeah, i mean well, I, I, if i hadn't gone into asian biology i would not know what that was to this day don't learn anything else <laughs> from this interview you now know the end of your shoelace is called the aglet was that it seemed like it was quite a linear kind of thing mm. Uh, as it just gets shorter and then, you know, once it's finished, you're dead kind of thing. But it's not that simple based on, on what you were saying about observed length of telomeres. However, there's this association with shorter ones seeming to have a poorer prognosis. But it gets more complicated when we've tried to actually intervene with this. So what what what's happened there? It's been a really interesting story because... But I remember watching a Horizon back in the 90s when I was at school, and they were basically like, we found telomeres, we found this thing called telomerase, which is an enzyme that can add extra bits of telomere on the end and extend them. We're all going to live forever. Mm. And there was this huge amount of hype when that gene was first isolated, first mm. discovered. It's, you know, it's won a Nobel Prize in 2009. So it's a, it's, it, biologically, it is a really big deal. Yep. But the challenge is, um, if you can extend a telomere indefinitely, that cell can then divide as many times as it likes. Mm. And medical audience members will now be thinking, what do you call a cell that divides as many times as it likes? We call it cancer. So by um, giving, uh, for example, a mouse, you can give it an extra copy of the telomerase gene that's constantly on, that's constantly extending those telomeres. You're kind of pre-ticking a box on cancer's checklist. Cancer wants to have that uh, additional telomerase to keep on extending those telomeres to carry on dividing and Mm. form a tumour. And so what they found was if you just give mice an extra copy of telomerase, they all die of cancer. They don't live longer. They actually live less time because they, they all you know, come down with cancer in their youth. 
So that seemed like uh, really bad news. And actually, I think, in a way, scientists are wired to be cynical. And I think yeah. scientists actually sort of overcompensated on receiving this news. They were like, we had this thing that was going to be the immortality enzyme. It was all over the media. And ha, 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 it just causes cancer. And it is the case that ageing and I mean, cancer... That, that is kind of like the worst possible outcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's often this opposition. Like, there are a lot of things where if you could, you, you, you know, you realise that the, the reason ageing happens in humans in the way that it does is partly as an anti-cancer mechanism. So those senescent cells right. are an anti-cancer mechanism. So yeah. this tension is, you know, comes up throughout biology. But I think scientists, like, as I say, ran a bit too hard with the cynicism. So can you titrate it a little bit? Well, this is the question. So there have, and there have been various more interesting studies that have happened in the intervening time. There's some really interesting stuff um, out of a Spanish lab run by Maria Blasco. And what they did was they sort of they kept running with a telomerase torch. And the first cool experiment they did was in 2008. And they added extra telomerase to mice, but they also added three anti-cancer genes. And so the, the, the logic being that these, these are genes that sort of look for damage in the DNA, cause the cells to do that apoptosis suicide thing sooner. And what they found was the mice lived longer and those anti-cancer genes seemed to prevent the additional cancer, which is really exciting. And I think that the, the sort of reason that worked is actually quite insightful into ageing biology as a whole. Because you might think, oh, the ageing process, it's super complicated, we can't possibly intervene. But actually, when you think about sort of what evolution was trying to optimise for, evolution was primarily trying to optimise for reproduction. Mm. And so... A mouse in the wild that had this genetic modification had more telomerase and more of these three genes. It will probably not survive as well as its its you know its neighbours who didn't have that modification, because you know I guess the way you can think about it is it's expending energy killing cells and then generating new ones, whereas its mates are just like reproducing like hell and they're going to end up out competing it. But since we you know we effectively live in a lab, humans have manufactured their own environment that's mm -hmm. much more similar to a lab mouse than a mouse living out in the field. And what that means is that we're optimising for a different thing than evolution was optimising for. And so we can perhaps optimise for longevity more easily than we might think. OK, so that's you've kind of preempted one of my questions there, which is sort of why ageing even exists. Mm. Um, so maybe we can take a slight tangent there. You, you've you kind of touched on it there, so, but I'm, I'm not sure I've quite understood what, what you mean. So like evolution has optimised for reproduction, so it's prioritized uh, as in through natural selection um, species that can have a high turnover rate as opposed to living a long time um, is that is that correct have I ever said that broadly right? broadly speaking yeah so it's, I think what's interesting is evolution is optimizing as you say for reproduction and it will do anything to get that reproduction and it depends on the environment in which you find yourself so if, if aging quickly is going to make you reproduce more quickly, then that's what it'll do. If aging slowly or, you know, doing going full tortoise and not aging at all is going to help you reproduce most efficiently, it'll do that instead. Mm. Evolution doesn't care how long or short your fur is, how quick or slow you can run, how long or short you can live. It will choose whichever value of those parameters allows you to reproduce the most effectively. Yeah. And I think a really good example of that is, uh, is the opossum, the humble um, sort of, they're basically cat-sized rats yeah. uh, that live in a variety of parts of the world. And there was this study done where um, looking at an island population of opossums. And so opossums on the mainland, they age remarkably quickly. They, they live a few years and they suddenly sort of drop off a cliff. Mm. If you're an ecologist, you see all these sort of these terribly rapidly declining, decrepit opossums like dying very, very soon. But this one population that was isolated just off the coast of the US, it probably got isolated about sort of five or 6,000 years ago, so long enough for a little bit of evolution to have just started ticking over. And what's interesting about this island is there's no predators. So the opossums are much freer to wander around to do their thing. Mm. Now, imagine you're in an environment on the mainland. There are loads of you know various things that want to eat you. Yeah. What that means is you need to, you're, you're more yeah. likely to die by being eaten by whatever it might be than you are to die of old age. You're never going to get to that old age to die because you're going to be eaten first. So your evolutionary strategy is pop out those kids as fast as possible. Mm. And then that means you'll pass on your genes to the next generation. Yeah. Whereas if you live on an island, there aren't any predators. You can afford to mature a bit more slowly. Maybe that means you'll get more goes at reproduction because you can have you know a few kids each year for a few more years or something like that. Mm -hmm. So your strategy is just completely different. And if we look at you know sort of opposite ends of the mammalian survival spectrum, then something like a mouse, its environment is really threatening. There are cats with sharp claws. Yeah. There are um, you know there's diseases. Mice are so tiny they can just die of exposure on a winter's night because yeah. their you know their surface area to volume ratio is bad and they just chill out. In that sounds very very nice, doesn't it? Actually, they they, <laughs> they, they freeze to death. Basically, yeah. it's horrible. Um, why am I laughing? Good question. Whereas if you think about the other end of the sort of size and longevity scale, something like a bowhead whale, which is the yeah. longest lived mammal, yeah. they're enormous. They have very few natural predators. Uh, they can afford to have, you know, they, they reproductively mature much, much later. They live up probably over 200 years, we think is the estimate, mm. which, you know, compared to a mouse, they probably live six to 12 months in the wild. Yeah. Just fantastically different. So evolution will do whatever it wants in terms of right. lifespan. Yeah. And it's just massive. It's, it's much more malleable than we'd think. So I think a lot of us think that aging is this inevitable process. And that happens because, you know, 
all our friends and family age, our pets age, our farm animals age, because we're all mammals and mammals all seem to be part of an order that ages for evolutionary reasons. But if you look more widely in the animal kingdom, there's just this whole diversity. Of, there, there are even some animals that age that seem to age negatively. They get less likely to die as they get older. Oh, like what? So the, there are some fish. And the, the reason for this is really interesting as well. Again, it's about maximising reproduction. Like that, if, you, if you know nothing about evolution, in fact, all, all you need to know about evolution is it maximises reproduction. Mm. And that's because you get these... Um, in fish, most of the reproduction is done by what are called boffs, which is this fantastic acronym. It's big, old, fat, fertile female fish. So I think there are four Fs on the end wow. of that word. Okay. And these big, old, fat fertile female fish what they what they do <laughs> is, yeah, really is um they when, when they get to a certain age they're they're much much bigger obviously that hence the acronym and they can produce more and more successful eggs and by by factors of like dozens compared to younger female fish and so what that means is that by far the majority of the reproduction is done by the handful of fish that make it to that old age and that right. means if you make it to that old age evolution has a huge incentive to keep you alive and pumping out those eggs so it's like some sort of Fish Hunger Games, <laughs> like the winner gets the spoils. Really, really takes all, and wow, like okay. so. Therefore, evolution, you know, maybe they age at a normal type, normal pace during their youth, while they're at risk of being scoffed by a larger fish. But once they get to this large size, where they're too big to be eaten, and you know, pumping out those too big if, to fail, <laughs> they're, <laughs> pump, they're, on the banks. they're being bailed out by their <laughs> s sheer efficiency in producing eggs. Right, and so you end up with this negative senescence, which is a really that's, fascin that's fascinating. That's a new one for me. I've not heard of that, but certainly the the sort of negligible senescence mm. species. I was going to ask, do they achieve sexual maturity later, as a rule? That, that yeah. So normally there's there's this sort of there's a weak correlation between size and lifespan, which is probably mainly to do with like m most big things are harder to catch and eat in various mm. ways. It also might be the correlation runs the other way, or sorry, the causation runs the other way to some extent because it takes a long time to get big. Mm. But there's also a correlation between age of sexual maturity and lifespan because obviously you don't want to reach sexual maturity at you know two and a half if your average lifespan is three. <laughs> you've yeah. got to you've got to get exactly. pretty busy in that last six months. And are there any species? I mean, I guess it, you can't have the best of both worlds you can't achieve that sexual maturity quickly and grow and then have a long life are there any species that kind of do both or? i don't think so and i think that the, the sort of i think this is probably slightly wrong but i think it's a good enough analogy that we can run with it is that imagine you're like putting together a body you can either do a slapdash rush job which means you're going to not bother with cancer prevention mechanisms, you're not going to bother making sure the arteries don't get calcified and full of plaques and stuff. Yeah. Or you can do a really careful job and assemble everything really slowly and do all the checking on the DNA to make sure there aren't any mutations every time anything happens. That's going to cost a lot of energy. Yeah. And so that means you're going to mature very, very slowly. You, you, know, you have to, by definition. Whereas if you whack the body together quickly to get it to reproductive maturity, it's just going to fall apart. Which so, one are we? Well, we're, we're in this strange middle ground. We live a very long time for our body size. Mm. Um, and that's probably actually mainly a social phenomenon, which right. is really interesting. Because sure. we're this animal, we can club together and we can reduce our mortality by, you know, the whole being the sum, greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. Um, so we live a very long time for our body size. But there's this really fascinating theory, and I, I don't even know if there's a way to prove this. But because when the when the asteroids smashed into the planet and killed all the dinosaurs, 65, all, all the ones that didn't turn into birds, I should be more precise, sure. 65 million years ago, the few animals, that, the mammals that survived were mainly the small mammals that mm. could reproduce quickly. Yeah. And what that means is they were in this category of, you know, burn fast, die, die young sort of thing, you know, reproduce really quickly. And as a result, we have inherited that genetic legacy from them. And so even though we are now much bigger, much longer lived animals we've still got that relatively quick mortality rate doubling time as you know, compared to the rest of the animal kingdom. Mm, interesting, interesting. This takes me back to maybe our first conversation, which was one of my early videos about the uh, uh, unwritten yeah. rule of a billion heartbeats. Um, and, and I think maybe that was the first time we, we sort of had a proper chat um, about metabolism and, and sort of rate of living in, mm. in uh, so it, yeah it's kind of all related to that that's a very good video by the way you should go and watch his billion heartbeats video i cited that in my book because honestly it's actually it's the best source there are a few papers but yours was the most oh. comprehensive and you know this is really adversarial isn't it we're absolutely taking chunks out of each other well that's, that's uh, very kind of you to say in a, in a non-adversarial way and of course you know this whole interview i'm sure um is is based around andrew's book which is fantastic and there's a lot of aging related literature out there you'll see a lot on social media and youtube um and it really cuts through a lot of the hype and, and i think strikes a really fantastic balance with not sort of going overboard but we will get to that topic uh, a bit later on so in terms of the, the the other um kind of aspect of aging that um i wanted to talk about or rather the the, the targets why don't we move on i guess we've, we've talked a little bit about the pros and cons and, and things that have been encountered when trying to 
extend telomeres and, and trying to remove senescent cells. Um, a couple of the other targets I wanted to explore, and, and by all means say ones that you think um, might be worth mentioning as well, but uh, certainly a hot topic amongst the health influencers and the, the bro scientists is autophagy and um, uh, rapamycin as a potential therapeutic. So what's the deal with all that? Yeah, I'm I'm quite excited by this mm -hmm. stuff. I'm not sure I'm ready to start bro sciencing and popping rapamycin myself, mm. but I'm certainly watching it with interest. The the idea is, and this is let's let's start with the legit aging biology. You know, so often with this bro science, it's based on a foundation of you know really solid work. Mm. And so, uh, the reason that we're interested in autophagy is this process of sort of cellular recycling. So auto, oh, we're going to do the derivation again. It's auto self phagy eating. It's the way that cells like eat their own internal components and then use them to build new components. And so what that means is, um, if you say, for example, you, you don't eat for a day, then your cells haven't got this incoming source of sort of fresh dietary protein. So if they want to manufacture a particular protein, they're going to have to scavenge the parts from around the cell. And it turns out that when cells do that, they preferentially break down the older damaged versions of proteins, mm -hmm. and then they can recycle those components. And so it, se but it seems that if you, you know, if you gorge on food, instead it uses the lovely fresh pre-existing dietary protein and leaves the old sort of worn out components lying around the cell. And with this sort of very basic our aging is this sort of accumulation of damaged bits and bobs, which is a, a you know, very popular idea perhaps in the 80s and 90s um it seems that by clearing out some of that damage you're, you're going to be reducing the aging process and as i say it's related to what you know how much you eat and mm. calorie restriction is probably the most robustly tested intervention that slows down the aging process so that all seems fairly solid and it turns out that autophagy is regulated by something called tor and tor is a um a gene a protein um so stands for target of guess what rapamycin mm -hmm. and i think this is just a really fantastic example of how you know biology it's just, it's just so messy the reason we know this protein exists isn't because we did you know we, we sort of delved inside the cell and you can count every single protein it's because we found some drug rapamycin come to that in a second which can get in there and clog up the workings of tor and what that does is by clogging up those workings increases the level of autophagy and increases this level of cellular recycling so let's tell the story of this this drug because i think it's so cool it's just it's got this story. It's it's every stage of it is beset by ridiculousness so it started out in the 1960s when um the island of Easter Island, which is the one with the massive stone heads, which people will probably be familiar with, called Rapa Nui. I can see where that's coming from a bit later. But that's the, the, the Polynesian local word for the island. And that island was um, it was sort of a contested Chilean territory. It's, it's 3,000 kilometres, I think, off the coast of Chile. It's right in the depths of the Pacific Ocean. But the Chilean government decided they were going to build an airport. And the Canadians looked at this and went, wow, this island has been you know, perfectly pristinely isolated thousands of kilometres into the ocean from any kind of human influence other than the, people, you know, the native inhabitants for such a, such a, you know, for centuries and centuries. We should go there and like sample everything about the people, the landscape before um, you know, this airport comes in and ruins it. That was good foresight. So they set off on this massive naval ship called the, the USS Cape Scott and they, they landed. And this whole story is completely ridiculous because at the time some Chilean troops were landing and trying to like impose order on the on the on the locals. There was a rebellion. Uh, the scientists sort of get, got caught up. Thankfully not in the crossfire. I think there were a couple of shots fired, but nobody was killed. Um, in the sense that the the leader of the rebellion ended up hiding out in the scientists' camp and then escaping dressed as a woman, and went on to become the mayor of the island. Wow. And while all this chaos was unfolding around them, they were diligently taking their samples and documenting everything. And although they took thousands and thousands of samples, perhaps the most significant was a little file of soil they picked up from somewhere on the island. And um, when they took it back, that it was kept in storage for about, I think, six or seven years. Yeah, a few years, yeah. Until a scientist uh, working at a drug company called Aeust was... Um, he was playing around with the bacteria that they found in this soil sample. And they noticed, um, a little bit like the sort of story of the discovery of penicillin, but done in a more systematic way, they noticed that where these bacteria were, fungi didn't tend to grow on the plate. And so they thought, wow, this is a fantastic antifungal agent. And so they spent a really long time trying to uh, trying to use it as such. This scientist even actually took a little sample home and gave it to a neighbour with athlete's foot, and it seemed to clear, clear it right up. So it did seem to be working in that respect. But in spite of years and years of effort, and anyone who's ever you know worked in wet lab science will know this frustration, um, they just weren't able to formulate it into a drug that was actually you know, able to be used in humans. And in the early 80s, IAS, this drug company, decided to shut down the program. They said, this, you know, this is not going anywhere. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not going to be successful. So this scientist, undeterred, uh, stashed some of these bacteria that, um, uh, that, that were found in this soil in his freezer at home. Um, he was forcibly relocated in, in by a, his... In a yoghurt tub. Yes, right? marked yeah. do not eat. Yeah. <laughs> 
and he was forcibly we like this this makes it sound uh, like like fascism he was forced to move because of his job basically because yeah. you know this this lab was closed he was forced to move to the US so he taped that freezer shut during the removal process stuffed dry ice into it to keep these bacteria safely preserved and so effectively smuggled drugs across the US Canada border yeah yeah and finally you know after years and years of trying to persuade them managed to get this this reinstituted and actually what they're trying to do I sort of skipped a bit of this story here because although it stops fungal growth it turns out that because it targets tor which is this is something we now know with hindsight he didn't know at the time but that's a fundamental constituent of all um all basically complicated cells so anything from fungi to you know to fish to us to plants um they would all be affected by this and so um what, what what they thought was it seems to slow down all cellular growth what's a good thing if you can slow down cellular growth it's a cancer drug mm. so they kept on trying and trying and trying to turn it into a cancer drug but they also found that it suppressed the immune system it's a long and complicated story yeah um it ended up finally being approved as an immune suppressant for transplant patients but because it's uh, targeting this tor which is such a fundamental part of how our cells um how they age how they grow how all kinds of different processes are regulated by it it's actually a cardiology angle on this as well which is that um, when I was trying to work out how many lives rapamycin had already saved for the book, and this is one of those statistics you, you can't just look up, but I think probably the most lives it saved is because you can coat stents in rapamycin, and then when you put them into the patient, they don't. it sort of discourages the artery wall from growing. You, you, you know this better than I do, but it sort yeah. of discourages the artery wall from growing and then therefore keeps it as wide as possible for as long as possible, and so keeps that nice and wide. Have I got that right? Yeah, yeah. So, yes. I mean, it was, it was, it was one of the first uh, agents that we, we impregnated and coated stents uh, with because when you put in bare metal stents you'd get very early uh, endothelialization endothelialization of the uh, stent mm -hmm. and would rapidly uh, you know narrow, narrow just again. as badly so uh, this was one of the early drug eluting stents and since then they're, they're now we're sort of fourth generation but yeah absolutely rapamycin was 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 part of it i actually did a a podcast called the Stor the story of the stent where we, we went into this so the, the, just just because uh, it's a nice tidbit the do you remember the scientist's name it was Sago was it uh, yeah Soon Segal you yeah, might, you yeah. might be pronouncing so he, it better than me yeah he was uh, Indian, uh, a Indian a Canadian and then resettled in in America so a uh, nice nice little um, character in yeah in there's the a great history. radio lab episode where they interview yes, his that's kids the one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, fantastic yeah, yeah. yeah I really enjoyed that and I think even his his, his was his wife I think his wife's and, in it as well and saying how you know there's this this yogurt pot in the freezer for years <laughs> so great story um tolerant wife <laughs> indeed um the so yes so let's bring us kind of more up to date mm. with rapamycin yeah sorry so that story is, is just great it's, it's, great. A, it's I mean, a massive sidetrack um and, and it's but it's nice to you know color color in uh, a lot of the characters in, in this history. So yeah, so rapamycin now. So fast forward. Uh, there's 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 yet another roadblock before we get to now actually. Okay. So let's let's go through that. So the because it intervenes in this uh, autophagy process, people knew that dietary restriction has an extended life. It was known that if you knock out the gene that, or one of the genes responsible for autophagy, you can stop the effect of calorie restriction. So people thought that this auto autophagy seems to be a really central process in aging. So they then thought well, we've got this drug that can interfere with that process. Why don't we try it? So they tried to give it to mice, uh, and there's this thing called the Interventions Testing Program. Um, this is a really fascinating sort of exercise in itself. This is the most robust data we have on clinical interventions, or albeit clinical for mice, uh, that's done in the US. There are three separate labs spread around the country. So the idea is that if there's any you know, accidental bias being uh, you know, in induced by any particular lab's protocol, it'll get washed out when you average it across those labs. They have really large cohorts of mice to keep the statistics nice and robust. They also use uh, wild-type mice, which is just a bit of jargon to say these are sure. these are normal mice. These yeah. aren't wacky genetic you know, inbred mice, which are often used in lab research. Mm. So this is the most robust measure of whether or not anti-aging drugs work. And rapamycin, well, they tried to test it. And they discovered that when they gave the way the way you normally give a drug to a mouse, the easiest way to give a drug to a mouse is to put a bit of the drug in the water, and so the mice will drink it up. And when they measured whether or not the drug was making it into their blood, it wasn't. They discovered that their formulation wasn't you know wasn't wasn't working orally, and so it took them two years almost mm. to actually turn it into an oral formulation and by this time the mice were 20 months old and th th that, as we've discussed is quite old for a mouse mm. and so a lot of the people you know a lot of the scientists involved like what's the point you know if you imagine this drug slows down aging say it slows down aging by 10 percent. let's just pick a random number out of the air then if it's like if you start at birth then that might make you live 10 percent longer but if you start 90 percent of the way through your life you mm. might live one percent longer it might be statistically indistinguishable like why are we even bothering but they thought you know what we've got the mice we've got the drug might as well and they did. And so not only was this the first and best demonstration of life extension in mice in a trial like this, but also fantastically, and you know, this is very exciting for any people over the age of 60 watching, you know, you can take this drug late in life. You don't have to start it as a 30 year old and that, that will then extend your life. It seems to do something even if you start at an old age. 
And so because of you know, the success in the interventions testing program, it's then been far more extensively studied in a variety of different animals in you know, all, all kinds of different places. And it is probably the most robust intervention we have as sort of a classic drug that can seemingly slow down aging. The real challenge is we just don't have great human data on this. Right. And rapamycin is not without side effects. Well, this is an interesting thing. And this is a classic thing that doctors say. Okay. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> now we're going to get adversarial. Do you know I hate doctors? <laughs> You're a doctor. This, this is classic <laughs> bro-science, isn't it? Like disparaging the medical profession. Um, so the, the, so I, um, let's give an example. I um, there's, a, there's a biologist called Lynn Cox, who's a professor at Oxford, um, okay. who I chatted, chatted to about when I was writing the book about autophagy and all these kinds of things. And during COVID, she, amongst others, she wasn't the only person doing this, but she, amongst others, was trying to get um, rapamycin, or rather a rapalog, a slightly different, a tweaked version, but basically the same drug, into nursing homes. And the idea is, because of its various effects, it seems to, in small doses, improve immunity. Now, it's really important to say the reason doctors are very sceptical of this is because it is an immune suppressant. That is its, that's what it's approved for. That's the only thing it's approved for, in fact, as far as I know. Mm. So if a transplant surgeon has ever heard of rapamycin or, you know, or any doctor, they've heard of it as an immune suppressing drug. What the hell are you doing going into a care home, a bunch of like nonagenarians who are already quite unwell? They're about to get... Why are you, before COVID, trying to give them a drug that will suppress their immune system? And I think that's caused a huge amount of scepticism in the medical community. But the doses that are hypothesized to be effective against aging and in fact to be effective to improve immunity are much, much lower than the classic immune suppressing mm -hmm. doses. But this is a really, you know, doctors are very familiar with the fact that d drugs at different doses can have very different effects. But I think this one is just so counterintuitive mm. that, uh, you know, it, it invites a lot of scepticism, particularly if you're a busy doctor in the pandemic and some some mad scientist comes at you and says, why don't we give this immune suppressant to a bunch of people in a care home? Understandably, there was well, some concern. I mean, doctors were giving all kinds of crazy things. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe, you'd have maybe you had luck. to go to the right doctor. Uh, yeah. Or yeah. the wrong doctor. Um, okay. But this is not new. So why don't we have the human data? What, what, what's the problem? I think there are a variety of roadblocks. Um, some of them are regulatory. Some of them are cultural. Some of them are financial. So one of the big problems is rapamycin, as we've just been through, it's like lengthy history. It was discovered in the 1970s. Um, whatever patents there were on it have expired. There are various sort of alternative versions of it, sort of updates that, you know, some of which are still in patents, some of which aren't even really rapamycin itself, but are various other things that interfere with Tor. But ultimately, you know, rapamycin itself, you can get for pence per dose. So it kind of feels like this is an easy trial to It is, up. but um, a drug company's not going to fund it. Because they're not going to make a huge amount of money off something that's, you know, generic. What about one of these uh, Silicon Valley well, this startups? Well, this is this is the question is that you know because the the, tr the trouble is drug tr drug trials are really expensive. So mm. there's a good example, um, metformin, which we might come onto in a minute. We we, we will. Um, yeah. But metformin, there's a big trial called Tame, which is going on. She's targeting aging with metformin. Yeah. Um, it's got a similar sort of um, it's got a similar uh, story to rapamycin. It's this, this random old drug that was used for something else that seems to slow down the aging process. We'll talk about it in a minute. But that trial is going to cost $70 million, and they've had real trouble raising the funding for that. And the reason it's going to be, so, you know, that sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. The reason for that is that um, you've got to get a bunch of people in there. It's a 3,000 strong trial, so 3,000 participants, 1,500 getting metformin, 1,500 getting a placebo. I hope it's not a sugar pill. I always find that quite funny because obviously metformin is a diabetes drug, so giving the other half of the child sugar seems to possibly be counter counterproductive. Um, but you, you, get, you can get to totally inert. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just just enjoy that description. Um, anyway, so it's a big, big trial. They're going to have to watch them, they think, for three, four, five years to get a statistically significant effect size. Yeah. And that means it's just going to cost a lot of money, even though the drug itself is phenomenally cheap. Sure. The, the trial it's, infrastructure it's, is really yeah. expensive and nobody stands to make any money at the end of that trial. I just feel like, you know, you've got so much interest in this field and particularly from billionaires, you know, the Peter Thiels and all the, these kinds of uh, uh, Jeff Bezos who, who who want to essentially cheat death and live forever. I mean, let's let's call a spade a spade. You know, th th I think that's their motivation. 70 millions, it's a drop in the ocean. You know, like I just find I, I've got a little... Lack uh, difficulty understanding why something like metformin, which we you know uh, we'll talk about in in a second, um, I mean that's very safe and taken by millions, hundreds of thousands of people, and um, you know it seems like that that could be set up really easily. Rapamycin, you know, maybe a little bit more challenging, but I, I, it's 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 a it's a source of disappointment I think because mm. and you know it plays into my inner cynic. When I hear a lot of the, the praise for these both these agents, I say, come on, then show us. You know, you, yeah. you've, you've got to show us. Like, you can't just keep saying this, this is going to work. This is amazing. 
I want some real world data. Yeah, and it's really frustrating because I think imagine you know it's it's fun to dunk on billionaires. I, I'll you know I'll join in that game if you like. But I think also it's really frustrating from a government point of view because mm. the amount of money that aging costs us, and I think we'll get onto this later. But you know it, it causes Alzheimer's, cancer. Sure. If we could delay those diseases even by just a few years, that there are trillions of dollars on the table. So if some government could just stump up a measly you know fifty million, yeah, seventy you're million. You're expecting <laughs> sort of forward thinking from a government. Yeah, though, which, that's, um, that's that's another problem. I've not not really counted in in my lifetime at least. <laughs> Um, yeah, so let's talk about metformin. So metformin, for, for those that, that don't know, um, is, as you say, cheap as chips. It's, uh, it's a diabetes medication, um, which is, you know, first line. So if someone's diagnosed with diabetes in the UK, type 2 diabetes, the first agent after trying lifestyle modification, the first agent we would start would be metformin. So, you know, very, very familiar, off patent, but then it seemed to develop this second life. So uh, how did that happen? I think the most interesting and convincing data come from this Scottish study um, where they were, it was a medical record study, so it was retrospective. They were looking back at what happened to a bunch of patients. And they found that, that, that so they, they were actually, the ultimate aim of the study was to compare metformin and sulfonylureas. You can mm. tell me if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Correct, which yeah, is another yeah. kind of diabetes drug. And so that was the, the primary endpoint. They were looking at those two different groups of people. They were also being trying to be as rigorous as possible. They included a control group who were taking neither of those drugs. And obviously the reason they were t- taking neither of those drugs is because they didn't have diabetes, so they weren't prescribed them. And what they found was metformin is better than sulfonylureas. That is one of the reasons it's the first-line therapy. And they also found that people who were taking metformin seemed to live not much, but very slightly longer than the control group. And this is doubly interesting because people with diabetes, they tend to be less healthy. Right. They tend to be more overweight. They tend to have you know more heart disease and a variety of other things that come along with that diabetes. And yet, if they're on the metformin, they seem to be living it was a few months. It was a small effect. Mm. But nonetheless, they start out less healthy and live longer. You know, what on earth is yeah. going on there? The challenge, of course, with this is that it's an observational study. Mm-hmm. So why do the people on metformin live longer? Well, maybe it's something to do with how metformin is prescribed. It might be something as mundane as the fact that if you've got diabetes, you're regularly going into your doctor to have various things checked. Like, So if you sure. get high blood pressure, your doctor's probably going to notice and put you on some blood pressure drugs or something like that. Yeah. So you might be getting more, more attention from the medical, yeah. medical yeah. system. Um, and that might be the reason they live longer. So what we need is this gold standard randomised trial. And that's what this TAME study that we were just talking when, when about. When do we think that... That those results will be well i'm really hoping it's finally going to, it was it was delayed because of covid it's been delayed because of this funding issue that we were just talking about i'm hoping they're going to start soon like probably maybe not this year but maybe the you know maybe sometime next year mm-hmm. and then it's three to five years for okay. the trial to run its so course it's too early to say metformin should be put in the water it's a very tricky thing isn't it because i think and this is actually a sort of a widespread it is too early to say metformin is put in the water let's make that clear before <laughs> i start my answer but what i find really fascinating about this is the sort of cost benefit analysis side of it so again we're in our 30s i don't know why i keep saying that during this podcast I just want to tell everyone how beautifully young we are <laughs> but we're in our 30s so we can afford to wait you know five years for the results of this trial to come out for a bit more data to emerge we're going to you know, carry on with our nice low risk of death. But if I was 70 and I looked at the data for metformin, it is not a slam dunk and I'm not giving medical advice. I'm not even the right kind of doctor to be giving medical <laughs> advice, let alone on a YouTube channel. But you know, you, you've got to look at this and say, well, if I'm not taking the drug also carries a risk. Mm. And I understand the hesitancy in the medical profession to start doling out drugs on the basis of you know, sketchy evidence or observational data. Or, you know, th- these things have been overturned. You know, the, best of, the best evidence, sort of basic science treatments can turn out to be completely disastrous when they actually get rolled out in a, in the, in a clinical context. But it's really fascinating to weigh up that cost and benefit as a patient. And mm-hmm. I think that particularly as we, we learn more and more about this stuff and more candidates are appearing on the horizon, we do need to think about how, as a as a medical profession, as you know, a society, we have these conversations and we think about these drugs that are they're going to be used in a very different way. You're not going to go to your doctor and say I'm sick. You're going to go to your doctor and say I'm now 50, so I've accumulated enough senescent cells, or you know, maybe it's time for me to start on this metformin stuff or whatever it might be. That's not a paradigm we're used to dealing with. It's not a sort of cost benefit trade off we're used to making. I haven't got any answers, but I do think it's a really fascinating question that you know sometimes not doing something is a choice in itself. Yes, that's a very good point. Yeah. Do we know how metformin may have an effect? Do we, do we know why it potentially is, is anti-aging? Therapy? I think that's a really, really good question. So in non-diabetics. In, non, in non-diabetics, yeah. And this is, this is the fascinating thing. So, you know, metformin 
medical people will be familiar with this phrase is a dirty drug. It's actually a filthy drug. Like drugs are dirty. This one hits all kinds of different things. And unlike rapamycin, which was discovered by, you know, we understand the mechanism and that it sort of came from the basic science. Mm. Metformin's uh, success comes mainly out of this sort of observational data or sort of potential success, I should say. Um, and it's because it is a filthy drug, it's, a, it's an extract of a French lilac plant. Like it's, you know, God knows what it, what it actually does. It certainly has some effect on glucose metabolism. That is why it's mm. given to diabetic course, people. Yeah. It also has some effect on mitochondria, um, which are the little power plant, the powerhouse of the cell. Um, so they're very important. They, you know, they generate the energy for your cells. Obviously, you know, one gets less energetic as one ages, and therefore, you know, that's clearly part of that process. They even have an effect on the microbiome, so the, the bugs in our gut, and that appears to be related to aging as well. Mm. There are probably more effects we don't know about. It's a, yep. it's a you know, promiscuous small molecule that's going around and doing all kinds of stuff all around your body. So I don't think there's a really coherent theory as to exactly what's going on under, under the hood. Okay, interesting, interesting. Any other potential like um, therapies or targets that that are exciting you at the moment i think one that's really hot at the moment and let's i'll talk a bit about how exciting it is on the one hand and the other hand in a second but it's this thing called cellular reprogramming so you might have heard of this altos labs which is oh, a yes, three have, billion yeah. dollar startup i'm not sure if that's the right term for a company with quite so much money wow but bezos is uh, heavily invested as is a, a russian billionaire called yuri milner bezos. um so you know obviously therefore garnered a few headlines and the idea of this process is that, um, so back in 2007 or 2006, something like that, a guy called Shinya Yamanaka discovered these four genes that can turn back the, the sort of developmental clock inside cells. So I could take one of your ancient skin cells, I could put it in a dish, they are ancient. I could yeah. add the Yamanaka factors, and it would revert that cell into what's called a pluripotent state. So that means yeah. a state where it can form any cell in the body. Nobel winner, didn't it? Yes, yes. Nobel winner a few years later for that really rather impressive piece of science. Yeah. And incredible that you can do it with just four genes. You might think it's this incredibly complicated process, but four genes are enough to orchestrate it. Um, so what he was interested in then is, is creating these, these pluripotent cells that can become anything. So he was interested in the sort of developmental side of this. But what we've since found is that not only does it reverse the developmental clock in cells, it also seems to reverse the aging clock as well. Mm -hmm. So it seems to extend telomeres, it seems to change something, something called the epigenome yeah. of those cells, which makes yeah. them appear biologically younger. There's a whole variety of sort of cellular spring cleaning and reverts a cell to a more youthful state. And there have even been some um, experiments in mice where they've... Uh, if, if you activate the amylaca factors like 24-7, you give them, just give them the gene, then again, cancer. This is a really common, as I said, sort of tension in aging biology because you, you do differentiate into these pluripotent cells, you get these disgusting tumours, they're called teratomas, mm. because the cell doesn't have any signals to tell it what to differentiate into. So it goes wild, goes everywhere. You get these horrible lumps of like matted hair and teeth and bits of eyeball and all kinds of disgusting things. If you ever find yourself in an anatomy museum, I would highly recommend going to check out some teratomas because they're just... They're often intrauterine. That's where they're often found. Yeah. So you get these masses out of women's they're, uterus. I mean, if, if you sort of divorce yourself from the way in which they were extracted, they are gloriously grotesque. Yeah. yeah. Um, so obviously that's bad news. We don't like those uh, yeah. in general. So therefore, again, very cynical. Oh, it just causes cancer. It's no use. And also... It's uh, very much a theme, isn't it? It's <laughs> like, oh, it's promising, promising, promising. Blam, cancer. And actually, these are it's even like... worse than that. These have got a second side effect, right. which is that liver cells work in your liver to do liver stuff because they're liver cells so if you de-differentiate them back into pluripotent cells pluripotent sounds super powerful and exciting but it doesn't do liver stuff mm. so you're, you're going to get massive organ failure as well so there are multiple you'll probably die of the organ failure before the cancer manifests to be honest it's a horrible you way to go revert to a big blob of <laughs> undifferentiated cells yeah it wouldn't be ideal it's not the sort of anti-aging therapy i dream of no um but what they found was that if you give these genes in such a way as they're activated by a drug, and that means that you, they only turn on when you give the drug, okay. you can, um, th and the way they did this in mice, they effectively gave them uh, these genes active at weekends. So it was two days out of every seven. They found that then you seem to be able to rejuvenate something in the mice and without causing all these cancers, without causing all the organ failure. This is a really early stage experiment, it's important to emphasize. This was done in prematurely aged mice. That, that's, there's a whole load of caveats associated with that that I won't go into now, but suffice to say it's not you know ready for the prime time yet. Um... And what's really sort of vexing about this therapy, it's I'm I'm genuinely excited by it, you know, don't don't let the cynicism overshadow that. Um, but it feels to me like a therapy that's fallen through a wormhole from the future. And what do I mean by that? I mean like um it's it's this incredibly powerful it's sort it's of a cheat too powerful. It's a cheat code for biology. Right, yeah. It's like how how is it that we've come up with four genes that can turn back the clock? The question is not does it work, I think it probably works to a, a fair extent. And we're gonna, you know, they're three billion dollars to find out whether or not it does. The real question is 
can 2020s biotechnology and medicine turn this into a workable human therapy? I'd be assuming it works, and we don't know whether it does or not yet, but assuming it works, which seems fairly likely, I can well imagine in 2100 that humans will be having themselves reprogrammed in some way, shape or form. However, you know, gene therapy is not ready for the prime time yet, certainly not for, you know, healthy people as they will be currently defined by the medical system. Um, so what we're going to have to do is just just wait and see if mm. we've got the sort of biology chops to turn this into a working therapy. So hugely, hugely exciting, literally turning back the clock in cells like that's yep. that does sound like I'm talking bro science nonsense, but it's real. But then can we actually put it into practice? Right. That's uh, I'm going to ask you towards the end of the interview, your predictions for the future. So we'll, mm. we'll, we'll, we'll talk about sort of what the future might look like. So you mentioned calorie restriction as um you know, one of the most effective ways that we, we've um, found that, you know, you can promote autophagy, which has clearly led to the general um, or proliferation of diets that involve fasting. And I don't want to get into a whole topic about that, because obviously that is that is huge. But do you think that that is an over extrapolation uh, from the kind of basic science mouse models that we've seen? Or because uh, as far as I'm aware, you know, so I I, uh, I never talk about my own diet stuff because I just am not particularly interested in... Do not want that fight. I, I just, you know, it, it's just uh, always quite a, a toxic environment. But I think anybody who's watched this far into this <laughs> interview is probably not the... That, you're probably quite a erudite, thoughtful person. Um, so I, I will uh, volunteer that for three years, I essentially fasted every day for 22 hours. Wow. Not every single day. You know, if I, somebody wanted to go out for lunch, I'd, I'd go out for lunch. Mm -hmm. But um, most days I, I, I would just eat once a day in the evening mm -hmm. um, for a long time. Do you think I've actually done any good to myself with that? Or is, is this uh, so tough? Is, is this just uh, a bro science leap from a mouse model? <sighs> This is this is I think one of the most annoying questions. Uh, Sorry, when, when, no, no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> when I was writing the book, this was one of the things that frustrated me the most because you always feel like if you just read one more paper, yeah. the epiphany is waiting for you, and yet you just end up more confused. So let's like rewind back to the nineteen thirties. I am astonished that we didn't do more research on this basically immediately because these these rats they live like. 50% longer mm. um, they were getting less disease the problem was I think in that environment in the 30s it was a time when nutrition was a really new science that's why these studies were being done they were wondering, wondering about the development of kids and vitamins were just being discovered it was that sort of you know heady time and actually you know most people weren't living to significantly old age sure. so no one's really interested in the sort of cancers and the heart diseases of this world or very few people were. So those re results sort of laid dormant for decades and decades. But then suddenly in the 70s and 80s, there was a resurgence of interest. And we've tried this in loads of species. It works in um, everything from yeast. What, what form of calorie restriction are we talking about? Like, you know, is it is it fasting 12 hours a day? Does that do anything? Or were they going days at This a is time? such a good question as well. So, so, let, so, so, you know, it works in like yeast and worms and flies and, um, you know, mice and rats and dogs. Maybe monkeys, I'll talk about that in a second. But to answer your question, the reason I just carried on with my answer really rather than, <laughs> rather than answering the, the, inter, the supplementary question you asked. Imagine the sort of the regimens have to be very, very different depending on the animal that you're talking about. So C. elegans, which is this tiny little nematode worm, very commonly used yeah. in aging research. The way that you cut back on its calories is that you that, that they eat bacteria. Uh, so you normally get a bunch of bacteria on an agar plate. You give them some antibiotics, not so many as to kill them, but enough to stop them dividing. And that means that they get a nice constant diet throughout their lives. So you thin out that bacterial lawn, as it's called. Mm. That's the way you do the calorie restriction on them. Um, if you do it on that, there was a little, I think it was a water flea this was done on. So they thinned out its manure infusion media, which is what they feed it on. And that was dietary restriction. If you do it in mice, and this, I think this is the one that really actually speaks to your question most directly. Um, mice are nocturnal. PhD students are normally diurnal. And what that means is that if you want the PhD student to feed the mice, it's always the PhD student who does jobs like this in the lab. Then what they're going to do is they're going to perhaps wait till the end of the day to try and be as kind to the mice as possible. And then they dump all the food in the cage. Then they leave, you know, go home. And what that means is that the mice that are fed what's called ad libitum, so they can eat what they like, yeah. which is normally the control group in this experiment, they can eat whenever they like. But the mice that are fed on a calorie-restricted diet, they eat all in one massive go. Because you've been starving for 23 hours, you're going to be absolutely ravenous. You're a mouse, you know, you've got a fast metabolism, you've got tiny, tiny little fat stores and stuff. Mm. You're going to be really quite hungry. So they snaffle down all their food probably in the first hour. So is that a calorie restriction experiment? Or is that one of these time-restricted feeding diets, mm. sort of by proxy? And which effect is the one that's driving what's going on? Yeah. Um, there's, I would say the balance of evidence is that the important thing is the calorie restriction rather than the time at which you eat. 
Fine. And actually, I so I started. I've tried to experiment with a few of these things, a little bit of, sort of gonzo journalism for the book, and just I, I find it very very difficult to do. To, you know, I think I can probably not eat for sixteen hours is okay, but as you start to push further, for, you know, twenty two, well done, sir. Um, but what I think is really what was really frustrating about this was me and my wife started doing time restricted feeding. We were eating in eight hour windows, mm. and that's actually not that hard because I, I often that's, skip yeah, breakfast, exactly, you know, as yeah. a youth. And so I just thought, you know, you, you eat your last meal before eight pm. You go to bed. You wake up. Don't eat till lunchtime. You know, yeah. have, have a, a late brunch the next day. Fine. But literally the week we started doing that, the best study so far on time restricted feeding came out. And you always have to be very cautious of these human studies. This was one that was done in was obese that patients. E- Ethan Weiss. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Testing yeah. for weight I've loss. I actually chatted to him about that. Yeah. And. Um, it's it's so fascinating, but they were testing for weight loss in obese people, and so therefore it's not it's you know it was it was probably a white population, so it's probably similar to my genetic background, but I'm not obese, so the question is you know does that apply directly to me? Yeah. And their primary endpoints are things like weight loss. And what they found was um, people who are time restricting their feeding didn't lose any more weight, and in fact what they lost was muscle mass and gained fat mass in a way that compensated, and so they didn't lose much weight. That sounds bad on the face of it. They also measured a bunch of metabolic stuff. They didn't really do anything directly that sort of asked the kinds of questions an aging biologist would ask. But things like uh, their insulin and their glucose, their sugar levels, um, they didn't seem to have changed in the way that you would imagine they would if they affected the aging process. Mm. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, this was a few months long weight loss study. It wasn't a few years long or a few decades long, ideally, longevity study. And so it's really, really hard to tease this stuff out. And... As I say, I think sort of the balance of evidence is probably it's how much you eat rather than when you eat it. But I wouldn't be shocked if there was at least some effect. And the real the real challenge of all of this is it's hard to stick to these diets. The kinds of people who can might be genetically or otherwise, you know, different to people who, like me, just get starving and very angry. <laughs> and so maybe, you know, maybe there's a systematic difference there. It's hard mm. to tease out. Um, the study that was done in monkeys, I said I'd come back to. And I, I think this has... This has a conclusion that's overly reassuring, again, for cynical scientists, which is that there were two very, very long-term studies done in rhesus monkeys, which are probably the closest analogue to humans we can come up with in, you know, mm-hmm. in experimental science. It started in the late 1980s, and there was one at the University of Wisconsin, one at the National Institutes of Aging, both in the US, and they were both um, set up in quite different ways. So at the National Institutes of Aging... The monkeys were fed this natural diet. It was full of all different kinds of fish and vegetables and grains and stuff, and... Um, there were some that were allowed to do what they liked and some that were given a, a more restricted version of that. At the um, at the University of Wisconsin, they went for what sounds like a more sciencey approach, which is that they thought, you know, fish and grains and natural stuff. It's very hard to be precisely sure what's inside those particular products, and particularly over like a 30 or 40 year period while you're doing this experiment. So they thought, let's make these nutrified nut- pellets. And they made them out of, you know, fats and sugars and protein and blah, blah, blah. But actually, if you look at the composition of those pellets, they are effectively the sort of monkey equivalent of hamburger fries, you know, mm-hmm. very sugary soft drinks. They're, they're not what you'd define as a healthy diet necessarily. And so there were monkeys that were allowed to eat as much of that as they wanted and monkeys that were then on this restricted version where they were only given a limited number of those uh, delicious fatty sugary pellets. And what they found was, over the, these two studies, which are now broadly concluded, I think there might still be a couple of monkeys living, but, you know, they, 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 mo- most of them have died by now. Most of the science has sort of come out of this. In reverse order of healthy lifespan, the ones who lived the shortest healthy lifespan were the ones that were eating as much burgers and fries and sugary fatty pellets as they liked. And that makes perfect sense. sense. The ones that were sort of somewhere in the middle were these ones that were having either a calorie restricted version of the burgers and fries. They weren't allowed to eat as much as they wanted or the ones that were eating the... um, the ones that are eating the fishy, uh, you know, grainy, vegetably natural diet, but as much as they liked. And then there was a small but not particularly significant improvement on the ones that had this calorie restricted version of the sugary, uh, sorry, of the of the vegetably, fishy, grainy, delicious diet. Mm. So I think what that says, if you're going to be a cynic about this and you, or and or want to change your diet as little as possible, it suggests that not eating as many burgers and fries as you like is a good thing, which I think we knew before this study was conducted. Yeah. Um, but if you're already eating a basically healthy diet, there's not a huge amount to be gained by further restricting what you eat. Mm. Um, so, so basically, you know, that's really a repetition of existing health advice. I mean, that's in a nutshell why I don't tend to spend too much time making videos about diet stuff and why I, I feel like when I talk to patients actually it's a lot simpler in real life than I think a lot of people make out is I think you, you know exactly that there, there there are some very simple messages to take mm-hmm. home 
So that's 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 uh, really interesting. I didn't know about that um, that study. So you heard it here first. Uh, fish and vegetable pellets <laughs> is uh, how you uh, live. There's no it. fish and vegetable pellets. They were given actual oh, fish and vegetables. Actual fish and ve- well, okay, that is just that's, normal that's advice. Exactly. That that is just yeah, that's totally really, that's really boring. Advice. What's strange is though, obviously, d- reading these studies. I was just starving the whole time. I was like, give me the fatty sugary pellets right now. Really? I am literally yeah, yeah. Sla- slavering. It's Were crazy. They in, in the shape of a little burger. <laughs> yeah. Um, I yeah, eat, eat fish and vegetables. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> well, well, on that uh, bombshell, let's uh, move on to some of the potential therapies. And some sound quite promising. Some maybe a little further in the future. And here, here, here comes my inner cynic. Um, a lot of the, you know, we, there are other ones we haven't mentioned today, but there are, you know, substances and, and compounds and chemicals that we found like aspirin or turmeric, which seem to have some sort of in um, vitro effect. And they're all promising and all, all sort of worth investigating. Fine. I agree with all of that. But this reminds me a lot of uh, the research that I did for my uh, PhD research, which was... Um, in the field of something called ischemic preconditioning. I won't go into all the the science of it now, but essentially we were looking for, and not just us, many teams around the world, were looking at different agents to protect the heart uh, if in the event of a heart attack. And we kind of had a running joke that pretty much anything was found to become cardioprotective. Like any, any drug we'd test, you know, you just pull out anything from the shelf, new drug, old drug, it didn't re- matter. They, Everything, not quite everything, but so many substances seem to have a cardioprotective effect. And yet in practice, and this is, you know, my research, which <laughs> was a bit of a shame that it, uh, you know, it came back neutral, um, is because every intervention that we found in, in reality didn't seem to have that effect. And that's not, you know, exclusive to this field. It's in, in many areas of medicine. And I think that's why a lot of um, clinical doctors who, who are sort of less involved in the day-to-day research um, often get a little bit, uh, have, t- tend to receive some of this stuff with, with a little bit of cynicism because there's a huge gulf between basic science translated into, into clinical science. So um, it, it, it's kind of, I, I'm not necessarily asking for, for, for a, a view on that, but it just it makes me think of that kind of um, thing. Another example, which perhaps is a bit more relevant, is the removal of amyloid plaques. And, and, and we've often been fooled with mechanistic arguments. And I think, again, this leads to a lot of the bro science kind of conclusions that we, we draw up a mechanism like, say, the, the TOR pathway, mTOR. And um, it seems really logical. Like, OK, if we just intervene at this point, we can interrupt this process. And for the amyloid plaques that I mentioned is was, was specifically thought to be the, the causative agent in Alzheimer's. And there have been attempts to, to try and address these, which, as far as I'm aware, and I, I, you know, I'm not a specialist in the field at all, but they, they, they haven't really delivered what we hoped. And, um, you know, whether that's just our mistake, that there's a reverse causality here, and, and actually it's not the causative agent, but it's the Alzheimer's leading to the, that, perhaps that's our mistake or perhaps we are just looking at it way too simplistically and you know taking it out is not actually making the difference so how i i I think maybe sometimes i think you're perhaps more of an optimist than me and and um do you worry that that could be the the same story with some of these things i mean i think it will be the same story i think that's just the sort of the 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 attrition rates during the various phases of drug development is enormous and that's mm. because as you say you know you go from mechanism to reality often you know if you're trying it on card- cardiac cells in a dish you're not trying it on all the other cells in the body and so of course there might be some side effect that overpowers whatever effect you're originally yeah. seeing i think the reason that i am somewhat optimistic about all this aging biology stuff is that there are mechanisms mechanisms do fail but we've got lots of different ideas to target these mechanisms and i think something something i'm a bit skeptical of is these things where they just drip every you know every compound in tea that they might possibly find on some cells in addition see what happens i think if you're specifically targeting some of these hallmarks of aging they're not a perfect list that i'm sure they're not a complete list i think we're going to find an 11th and a 12th and a 13th item when mm. i you know write ageless 2 this time it's immortality yeah. um but you know we're we're certainly at a point where we've got enough of an idea and we've got enough 
ideas for each of the, you know, in the book I sort of break it down. We have multiple ideas per hallmark. I wouldn't be surprised if most of them fail, but I'd be very surprised if none of them work. Right. So there's that sort of that, that flip side of it as well. Um, and I think the amyloid is actually a really interesting example in that. Um, so the reason the amyloid hypothesis originally started was because, well, back in 1906, when Alois Alzheimer, the German guy who discovered... Um, German guy who discovered amyloid plaque or discovered Alzheimer's disease of mm. course he cut open the brains of patients and discovered this this horrible gloopy stuff turned out to be amyloid plaque um I actually read a really fascinating thing on his Wikipedia page so when he made this discovery he went to the University of Tübingen which is one of the you know most esteemed medical schools in Germany uh to, to talk about his results but the audience were incredibly uninterested um none of them asked him any questions and you know it basically went completely unnoticed and that's because they were actually there to see the next speaker who was going to be talking about erectile dysfunction so they had all turned up for that talk, classic, and uh, just you know basically slept through the Alzheimer's one, which actually you know, which turned out to be a more clinically significant discovery. Wow. Well, um, anyway, so this this you know this was discovered right back at the very outset of our understanding of Alzheimer's disease, and obviously as we got better at you know microscopy and you know um, molecular biology, we worked out what this weird gloopy stuff was. It was this stuck together protein called amyloid, um, and then the sort of real. The birth of the amyloid hypothesis was in the late 80s and early 90s, and they found people who had what's called early onset Alzheimer's. Mm. So normally, um, if you have, I shouldn't really use the phrase normal genes, but if you have the most common uh, amyloid genes, you will basically not get dementia before you're 60. It's almost impossible. And yet after the age of 60, there's this steep increase, such a, a doubling time of your risk of about every four and a half years. So it's faster even than the aging process itself. Mm. So it's very, very rapid onset, but it's very late onset, crucially. Um, but if you've got early onset Alzheimer's, some people with really unfortunate mutations can get dementia starting in their 20s. More commonly, it's in the 40s, 50s, 60s yeah. sort of time. And most of the mutations that are of relevance here are related to this amyloid gene. And so, so these things cause the amyloid to build up much, much more uh, earlier in these people's brains. And that seems to be what's causal of the dementia in their case, because that is the one thing that's, you know, quote unquote wrong with them. Um, and so therefore, it seems that amyloid is sufficient to cause dementia. The question is, is it necessary and is it the causal agent in um, people who are de developing dementia as a sort of side effect of, of normal, again, quote unquote, normal ageing? And that is, you know, something that has been tested repeatedly. And we've got very good drugs that are very good at clearing amyloid now, but they appear to have very little in terms of clinical significance. There was actually a trial this week of <coughs> IMAB, which is another antibody that, that cl clips onto amyloid. Mm -hmm. um, it did have a clinically significant improvement in the cognition of the patients. However, okay. sorry, I said clinically significant, didn't I? I should have said statistically significant. Right. So it's a, it was, I think it was a 0.45 score reduction on this dementia score. And the article I read, the other, the, the expert who wasn't involved in the study, it so it didn't sound, sound like, like very much. Yeah. Um, the fact that it's, it's giving a, an a clinically observable outcome is, is a huge deal. 0.45. I mean, what's the scale? I as? can't remember. If it's out of 100, yeah, exactly. it doesn't, doesn't feel like it's that big. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what the scale was called, unfortunately. But like, it's so it's. It's been very, very slow progress yeah. to even get to that fairly small increase. One of the theories as to why that is, is that perhaps these, particularly the antibody interventions, which are the most effective at clearing the plaque, if mm. not creating the clinical benefit, is that the way these work is they latch an antibody, so this immune part of your immune system onto the amyloid, and that antibody acts as sort of like a red flag to your immune system, says, come and clear me up. And the problem is that means the immune system comes barging into the brain and smashing up brain cells left, right and centre. So maybe you're actually countering the benefit of removing sure. the amyloid with the disbenefit of creating this huge amount of inflammation in the brain. Um, is disbenefit a word? I, it is now. Okay. I certainly don't. Do I have dementia? No. <laughs> There's, there's this real sort of tension about what might actually be, what might be the actual cause of dementia. Maybe there are some ideas that are coming through to non-inflammatorily, that definitely isn't a word, <laughs> <laughs> remove, remove the plaques from the brains of people with dementia. They might be more effective. I actually think dementia is going to turn out to be massively multifactorial. Yeah. And perhaps the most effective way to do it, I, you know, I don't wish to beat on my same drum continuously, but is to target the ageing process, which gives rise to the multiplicity of things mm. that ultimately go on to cause dementia. Yeah, well, I think that's a nice, uh, nice closing of of, of that um, chapter because I want to move on to something that I, I didn't want to put up front because for me it's less interesting, and I think actually I've been tremendously convinced by your arguments on this because I think I was like everybody else, and and you know I know you've mentioned that you frequently get this question, uh, and certainly when I first heard your hypothesis, I also had this thought because I think. A lot of people will say, hey, you know, aging is just part of life, right? I mean, that's like saying, you know, the sun 
uh, going around the sun is 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 uh, it's it's just a fact of of the universe, and um, if we try and stop it, we're going to just lead to a planet full of people that never die, and this is all billionaires who want to live forever, and um, we're going to just destroy the planet. So I know that's a lot of points. I've that just was, that made. was three questions in one. Well done. Yeah. Well, I don't <laughs> want to make it easy for you. I think I'll start by saying I understand where these people are coming from. Oh, I mean, so do I. I, I I'd be fascinated to time travel back to 2010 and present some of this stuff to me and see what my initial reaction yeah, was. Yeah, sure. Because um, I, I just don't remember. I've, I've indoctrinated myself over the, over the course of the last Radi- 10 years or so. radicalised. Yeah. So it's very, very hard to imagine coming at this for the first time now. But given how common this, these kinds of questions are, you know, I, I can totally see where people are coming from. It's, yeah. a, it's a, I, so at the end of my PhD, I was having a bit of a how can I most benefit the world crisis. And one of the things I very nearly did was go into climate physics. It's a really obvious place to go as a physicist, use all those numerical skills, model the climate, solve climate change. Um, that'd be good, wouldn't it? So I've got, a, you know, I'm hugely concerned about the environment. I don't want to destroy it by, by you know, trying to solve one problem and mistakenly causing another what was the, so the, the first question was isn't it a natural part of life and i think the thing i find most convincing about that is to look around nature and say no it isn't a natural part of life there are animals that literally do not age this mm. you know they, they are they are as natural as you can get there are animals living in the wild li- or in, in the wild that have been formed by evolution aging is not necessarily a natural thing and you can imagine if you know we were extremely intelligent tortoises and we were looking out in the rest of the animal kingdom and seeing these other animals whose risk of death did rise with time we'd probably pity them and consider our state to be the natural one so it's just a sort of freak accident of evolution it's an interesting thought experiment that we happen to have been you know blessed with these um these cursed mammalian bodies that are, are doomed to age in the way that they do mm. um so that's the sort of answer that you know is, is it a natural process the other thing i think this is really pertinent when we you know anti-aging medicine although anti-aging has this sort of checkered history it's about cosmetics and skin cream and you know it's about quacks peddling snake oil in the 1920s and that sort of thing um ultimately it's just medicine like you know why why do you do cardiology why do we have oncologists it's to give people longer and healthier lives and i bet you after a you know talk on heart disease no one has ever stuck their hand up at the end and gone oh doctor you know what are we going to do about all the people who are surviving heart disease won't they get bored with their extended lives aren't they clogging up the plant you just never get those questions and it's really fascinating to me clearly we do place sort of aging in this sort of separate ethical category mm. and address it with a whole load of sort of, uh, uh, of of tools that we don't think about the rest of medicine with but ultimately i think this is probably going to slowly percolate and it's just going to become so normal that we won't even you know even think of it in that way once it starts to become a reality um on the specific overpopulation question i can point people to there's a video on my youtube channel which i go into more depth than i'll yeah, go into great, now great video, um but I, th- I think the fundamental thing is it actually really surprised me how little effect it has on population. I think this is perhaps the most important argument. Um, I'm not a demographer. I'm not a demographic modeler. I'm no expert. So what I did was I went to some people who are, which is the United Nations. They've got freely downloadable data on their population models. And I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll just cancel aging in 2025 ridiculous assumption not only is that a crazy hey you never know yeah. i mean they could pull it out of the bag these companies i mean if i'd written the opposite in my book maybe i'd have sold more copies yeah. <laughs> but you know i that's crazy it's not not only is it a crazy time scale scientifically it also means we have to roll out the medicines to every corner every... of the world you know sure. no matter how poor no matter how rich no matter how inaccessible the communities are yeah this is not going to happen but let's let's imagine it as a sort of worst case scenario if you're a population pessimist yeah so the un the population now is coming up for 8 billion. Are we going to cross that mark anytime soon? Uh, depending on when you're watching this video, we might already have crossed that line. Uh, the UN projects that by 2050, we're going to have 9.8 billion people on the earth. So let's cancel aging in 2025. That means far, far fewer people die. The population in 2050 then would be about 11.3 billion. That's, well, is that a lot or a little? On the one hand, it's almost 2 billion extra people. That's, that's quite a lot of people. On the other hand, it's only 16%. And when we think about people often call this overpopulation i hate that word for a number of reasons but the, the one of the reasons is it's i don't care i mean i do care about people that's kind of the point of this whole conversation <laughs> but I, I don't mind how many people there are yeah in fact there are some arguments more people are better because there's more happiness in the world there's more you know musicians and scientists and thinkers to you know make the world a wonderful place but what i do care about in terms of the environment is how many resources we use it's the amount of carbon dioxide we emit it's the amount of plastic pollution we cause etc etc yeah so it's not about the population per se, it's about the amount of stuff that we consume, the amount of stuff that we emit. And so really we should be focusing on the consumption and the emission, not on the, the people themselves. Would I work 16% harder to cut back on my plastic waste and re- reduce my carbon emissions and do all that stuff that we should be doing anyway in order to allow, you know, to basically get rid of Alzheimer's and cancer? Hell yes, I would. 
And so I think you've got to remember what's on the other side of the balance sheet here. Like it's going to make environmental problems that little bit harder to solve. But the size of the additional challenge is so small compared to the 100,000 people who die every day of ageing that it's just dwarfed. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a really convincing argument. The other one that you made that I think is is very easy to connect with on a, on a human um, uh, level is progeria. When, when you, you mm. sort of gave the example of this condition, which is essentially a, a very adva- um, rapid aging process, which affects uh, children. And you've probably seen images of, of children who, who look like they're very old. And they're obviously their life expectancies expectancies are profoundly reduced so when you think about it like that and just isolate aging as, from its cultural sort of um, uh, context then of course you want you want to you want to treat it you want to, to save these these uh, very unfortunate uh, kids um, so I think that was also a very compelling argument I think the really important thing from a sort of global development point of view is my my aspiration in global development is that everyone in the world can enjoy the quality of life that you know you and I and most of the people watching this video frankly are enjoying mm. um, and what that means is currently the top I think it's about the top billion people depending on exactly how you split it the richest billion emit 50% of the carbon dioxide yeah. in the world and if you look at other forms of pollution other, other stuff you know consumption it all follows basically that same pattern if we want to get everybody in the world up to this level then we're going to have to dramatically reduce the per person footprint in order to get this lifestyle yeah. and i just think we're going to have to do that anyway you mm. know whatever whatever happens about aging whether it's over or under population like even if we literally killed the poorest 20 percent of people it would have almost no effect yeah, on that's, carbon dioxide that's a really and that's wild shocking statistic, like it's yeah. really it's really difficult to get your head around like yeah. this the sheer disparity in wealth in the world and i think that you know leveling that is one of the really important things that we have to do and that's a problem that we're going to have to solve anyway regardless of what happens with the population and i really wish there was just some more sort of clear-eyed debate around population in general because even the demographers are at fault here so one of the other things that i uncovered when sort of rooting through this demographic data is that the un there's another organization called the institute for health metrics and evaluation who Mm -hmm. are another big organization that does demographic projections they do not care about life expectancy they think that life expectancy having gone up by three months a year every year for the last 200 years this is an incredibly consistent trend they nonetheless think it's going to level off it's going to basically stop at the age of people currently living in japan why do they think that why do they think that i have literally no idea right. and especially because there's there's at least a chance that what i'm talking about is going to come to pass and life expectancy could actually accelerate in its increasing and they seem to have taken absolutely no interest in this in their models and there's, there's just some wild stuff in there so they think that I think this is the UN, I'm I'm not sure which organisation, I'm bad-mouthing now, but one or the other of them thinks that Japan's going to top out a bit above where it is now. Japan is currently the longest life expectancy in the world. America is never going to reach where Japan is today, and Nigeria is going to climb and climb and climb very rapidly as it develops, but it's not even going to reach the level that America is at today. And you're like, what what do you think of... America's going to come down to join it. (laughs) And you're like, what what do you think about Nigerians? That means they're not able to, you know, in 2100, enjoy the same life expectancy as Americans do now. And you think they're just... just putting the same function on, I think on so, each, but yeah. with a different starting point mm-hmm. and, and, and not actually taking any biology into the equation. Well, exactly, or just any base, like even 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 if we literally freeze medical progress today, Nigeria is going to be much, much richer by the end of this century, at least I very much hope so. And therefore what that means is they're going to have access to a lot of the modern medicine that we now have. So why would they not be able to achieve the levels that rich countries are all... It's not like we have to break, make a biological breakthrough for life expectancy in Nigeria to be 85. Yeah. Like that's a thing that countries around the world are already doing. Yeah. So the whole the whole field just completely baffles me at the moment. And I really hope there's some more serious... You know, underpopulation or overpopulation, It's just it, these are serious, massive questions about this, the future of the world. And we need better evidence. We need a better quality of debate. We need to realise that there are all kinds of policies we may or may not need to implement and you know, this isn't just biology this is like reproductive rights there are so many angles on this yeah. that we can't even really scratch the surface just you know two dudes in a garage <laughs> yes don't give away the secret that it's a garage um it's a multi-million dollar set uh, I, I i i i won't pose this as a question i'll just mention because i, I watched uh, this, this isn't a question it's a statement this this is a statement yeah a i mean I'm, I'm feeling already overwhelmed by how much we're talking about economics i i try and keep it off the channel if i can um but uh i i saw a, i think a wired they did a little series on aging um on youtube and one of the videos was about um People saying that, you know, yes, that's great, but there are much bigger challenges in the world and 
the things we can do to improve life expectancy are societal, structural, um, you know, um, all, all the things we know about it, uh, improving poverty. Um, and of course, that uh, neither of us would, would suggest that that isn't the case at all. And I would also say that, you know, it's not one or the other. You can pursue all these different things. But I think it's what, what I want people to take away from this interview and from your book is that um, this isn't about just prolonging life for the sake of prolonging life. This is about addressing all the things that aging causes, which, as you said, would be completely uncontroversial. If, if I said I'm, I want to yeah. eradicate heart disease or eradicate cancer, everyone would be on board. Mm. So I think that's that's one of the, the key take home messages. Yeah, and I think I, I've, I've had a few ding dongs with sociologists about this because they mm. say, you know, why? these drugs you know we've got people the, the life expectancy in parts of glasgow is 55 years old that is you know appalling it's, yeah. it's an abomination of modern society that that's that's the state of the place and you know the poor people who are living in those situations and what, what, what my response to that is is firstly as you say we can we can walk and chew gum we can do more than one thing at the same time and i absolutely advocate for public health for all you know for improving people's diets for making towns and cities more walkable and cyclable to integrate exercise into our daily lives blah 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 all the stuff that a lot of people you know already know they should be doing or already you know already know that we should be doing as a policy but what i think is really remarkable about this aging thing is that as, as we said right at the start of the interview actually um smoking basically accelerates aging drinking too much obviously it hits your liver more but it basically accelerates aging eating the wrong diet basically accelerates aging would i rather try and tackle poverty in inner city glasgow with an anti-aging pill in my back pocket that could slightly reverse some of the health problems that these people have and you've got to remember this this is a vicious spiral as well like why do these people stay in poverty because they get ill very early they find it harder to work they go into benefits that then leads to you know all kinds of different consequences mm -hmm. and the health has such huge sociological implications um as I say, you know, I'm not arguing against public health or arguing this is some kind of magic tech solution replacement for that important work. But I'd far rather be tackling that with an anti-aging pill in my back pocket that could then be used to try and slow down some of these consequences. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to close uh, the interview by asking you a bit more of a um, speculative question. Um, I'll just give my, my thoughts. I, I think, you know, uh, we've, we've joked about... Um, my general level of, of pessimism about the dystopia that we are heading into. But um, I, I read something a little while ago in the British Medical Journal. So this is, you know, obviously medical people responding about the top 10 medical interventions that have, you know, furthered humanity to, to the greatest extent. And of course, there were some obvious ones, vaccines, penicillin, but that was really it in terms of drugs. It was otherwise sanitation, clean running water, um, you know, all these public health measures. Mm. But in terms of sort of actual, um, was there maybe, maybe was Gleevec on there? Um, a chemo um, agent, perhaps um, insulin. You know, these are all, these are all old. You know, we haven't had a big breakthrough from a sort of pharma, pharmacological point of view for coming up to sort of a century now. Mm. Um, and and that's why, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that some of this comes, this stuff comes to pass. But I, I, I just always temper my anticipation slightly. So my question to you to, to sort of finish off the interview is where do you see the, the state? I, I, I won't ask you sort of medicine in general. That's a bit unfair. But the state of, of anti-aging... I understand that's a phrase that's not used in anti-aging. Uh, some people are very, some people are very anti-anti-aging. Yeah. So I, the reason I use it and use it fairly liberally is because I think it's very self-explanatory. Yeah. Whereas if sense. you talk about like geroprotective drugs, right? Yeah. I don't care about those. Do you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, in the field of anti-aging, mm -hmm. um, in say 2050, where do you see? Where do, you, where do you think we'll have got to? It's a good question. And I think, um, to add a note of optimism to your, like, looking back across the history of medicine, I think there's there are some reasons, albeit quite theoretical, to hope that anti-aging might be easier than some of the okay. attempts to treat cancer and heart disease. The reason being, when you're trying to treat cancer, most cancer patients are in their 70s or, or you know, are in their 80s or something like that. That means the cancer is occurring in a body that is failing in a whole variety of other ways. The side effects of chemotherapy are going to be that much worse just because their heart's already failing a bit. They've already got a bit of cognitive decline. I, I will say that's correct, but the cancer patients in trials are often significantly mm. younger, which is why these very expensive chemo drugs are often um, licensed and then don't 
deliver the uh, the same results. And that's a whole other conversation, just in the same way as women have been excluded from clinical trials historically, so too have old people who are often the recipients of most drugs. Yeah. So we really need, and this also old mice are rarely used because it takes a lot, takes two years to get a two year old mouse. Mm. So quite often you'll get a mouse and you'll give it a gene that makes the disease of interest happen in an otherwise young healthy mouse. Yeah. And so that's a whole another conversation. But yes, yeah, certainly we need to do many more trials in the actual patient population who are going to get the drug. But yeah, I think the reason that treating a lot of these end-stage diseases is challenging and the reason we haven't eked out much life expectancy benefit is basically because we can't. Mm. And to uh, to use a statistic I talk about in the book, even if we literally cured cancer, you can sort of do this theoretically by looking at causes of death. If we, you know, come up with some incredible pill that stops cancer being a thing of any kind, then we'd add probably about three years to life expectancy. And that's because most cancer patients have diabetes, have, you know, heart disease, have something else waiting in the wings to kill them. Whereas if you're tackling the aging process, you're tackling an underlying cause of all of these things simultaneously and you can potentially have a lot more luck. Mm. And to give another sort of example in the same vein, if you're trying to kill cancer, cancer is actively trying to out-evolve your drugs. It is fighting against you. Whereas if you're trying to kill senescent cells, the defining factor of a senescent cell is that it does not divide. So it's not going to fight back. It's, you know, it's therefore a much, much easier target potentially. This may or may not pan out, but these are sort of theoretical reasons why treating aging might be easier than treating the individual endpoints of aging, which are these diseases. So that's sort of a note of optimism. In terms of predicting the future... That is a good note of optimism. I like that. um, In terms of predicting the future... I think it's just, inc- apart from the fact it's incredibly hard in general, I think it's particularly hard in ageing because it depends a lot on luck, obviously. Um, and so Let's sort of imagine what could happen. And I, I often like to put this in terms of myself, not because I'm self-centred, but just because it's a nice, easy way. To, I, I'm, I'm at a, about the right stage of life to be, a, to be a really interesting time to be alive. So I'm 37. That means I've hopefully got, you know, maybe 45, 50 years in front of me if life expectancy stays where it is right now today. Um, you know, if I look after myself, I'm a bit genetically lucky. I might live another five or ten years beyond More of that. the pepperoni pizzas that we just had for lunch? <laughs> oh, delicious. Yeah, I, I, in my book, that is the top piece of health advice. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've got a, quite a long time ahead of me for anti-aging science to progress. Yep. Now, let's imagine these senolytic drugs we were talking about earlier, the drugs that kill the senescent cells. Um, they're literally in trials now. They're not in trials for aging. They're in trials for specific diseases where we know these senescent cells are a problem. They're also in trials for diseases where there aren't really any good existing therapies because these drugs, you know, let's be honest, they're experimental. They haven't been tried in humans before. So we don't want to be handing them out like sugar pills to the whole population. We want to be giving them to people who've got pretty serious prognoses. They're willing to take a bit of a gamble, if Mm. we're honest. But if those drugs are effective, they kill the senescent cells, they make the people better. But most critically, and this is the thing I'll be watching most closely, are they safe? Do they have a minimal side effect profile? Sure. Given what we've seen in mice, they might have a positive side effect profile. It might be that these people with lung fibrosis come out with glowing, radiant skin and you know ability to run further and faster on a treadmill. That's, you know, fingers crossed for them. Um, but you know, assuming they're safe, that's the most important thing. Because mm. that means we can then say, okay, you people with like late stage heart disease, they're not willing to take a punt on senescent cell killing drugs right now because you've already got a medicine cabinet full of effective, you know, long tested, safe drugs. You've got lifestyle interventions. You've got a load of other things you can do with them. But maybe if the senescent cell killing drugs are safe in people with serious diseases, we can try them in people with slightly less serious diseases. And if they then are effective, but most importantly, safe in that population, then we can say, OK, maybe you're 50 or 60 years old. There's nothing wrong with you as mm-hmm. the current medical community would, would define it. But you've accumulated a lot of these senescent cells, enough of them to be a problem. And if we're really confident in the safety of these drugs, and that's the thing that we really need to hand them out to healthy people, then we might try giving them prophylactically. And that's the real sort of dream of anti-aging medicine, is giving people drugs not when they're ill, but before they're ill to stop them getting ill in the first place. Now, as I say, these trials are happening now. We'll probably know in five years if they're effective against these particular conditions. If things move rapidly and we're lucky, which is obviously not a certainty, um, you know, it might be within 10 years that we're thinking about prescribing these as an anti-aging intervention. It might be 15, it might be 20. That's still in plenty of time for the majority of people alive today. Mm. And let's think about what's going on at the same time. There's Altos Labs investing billions in this sort of, uh, you know, through the wormhole reprogramming technology. Uh, There are gene therapies that we can use against aging as well. Now, gene therapy, stem cell therapy, these sound a bit sci-fi. They're certainly not something that I'd be, you know, rushing to an offshore clinic to be getting injected with right now. But they're are already gene and stem cell therapies in the clinic being given often to people with quite rare diseases again. That seems Mm. to be the sort of pathway these things take. And that means that we're beginning to understand how to do these more advanced therapies. So although, you know, we're probably not going to have gene therapies against ageing in the next five years, would I bet against them not being available in the next 30? I probably wouldn't. And as I was sort of going through this writing the book, I don't think we're going to cure ageing. I'm happy to use that phrase, even though it is a little, you know, we talked about the controversy around that earlier. Um, We're not going to cure ageing by, even if we hit every single one of those hallmarks, I don't think that's ultimately going to sort us out. 
But I think the way that we are going to sort it out is by understanding how all those hallmarks, how all the changes in our body link together. And what that requires is something called systems biology. And that is a humongous challenge. We need to understand how all the different bits of the human body work, how they all fit together. We need to build a computer model that can you know, churn through all this data and come up with some kind of meaningful conclusion. I was thinking, Andrew, this is, this is sci-fi. What are you, you know, this, the, the, you, you've jumped off the deep end now. This is the, the last bit of the last science chapter of the book. What are you doing? This isn't science, this is, this is magic. But actually, you know, if you look back at the last 50 years of progress in computing, um, I looked this up for a talk recently, and in 1972, the world's first eight inch floppy disk was commercialized. I mean, some viewers probably won't even know what a floppy disk is at all, let alone imagine what a uh, Norton inch is, yeah, <laughs> quite, yeah. quite frankly. So they'll have no idea what I'm talking about. Trust me, it's a very old piece of computing technology. And, you know, fast forward to today, and the memory cards and all the cameras that are recording this are vastly cheaper and hold vastly more data. Blah, blah, blah. You know, we, we, technology has been progressing incredibly quickly. And in biology, we're collecting more data than ever before. Genome sequencing has gone from, you know, $4 billion to sequence the first human genome in the early 2000s. Cost about a million dollars a time per genome after that. We're now in the low hundreds of dollars per genome. That means we're just collecting so much DNA sequencing data. And this isn't the only place in biology where that incredible reduction in cost has occurred. So again, in 50 years' time, will we have enough data to build a systems biology model? I don't want to be one of those Silicon Valley tech bros who's saying if we just collect the data, it'll I, just happen. I think happen. the fact you're saying 50 years already sets you apart from the Silicon Valley tech bros. I, I, think, think, I think that's yeah. a, a much more pragmatic, realistic kind of time frame. And what makes me really interested about that is I, I do have that same sort of pragmatism and you know i don't i certainly don't want to say anything like you know 10 or 20 years for, for a systems biology model of a human like you know, let's get mm. this in perspective here but i very much hope to still be alive in 50 years time especially if i can benefit from the first generation of senolytics perhaps i'll be taking metformin or rapamycin if they turn out to be successful or won't you know, maybe turmeric will turn out to be the, the miracle drug we've all been waiting for whatever it is uh, i don't know indians eat a lot of that <laughs> not doing <laughs> we so get a lot well of heart <laughs> but whatever it might be you know i, I can hope potentially to live more than 50 years if I you know again if I exercise if I eat well if I get the first generation of these anti-aging drugs maybe I will survive long enough to see those systems biology models so live long enough to live even longer yeah that's the phrase. <laughs> that's the one yeah so the, the the phrase used by it was originally coined actually by um by Ray Kurzweil who you might know from the singularity is near who predicted we're all going to be you know uploaded into AI computer bots in the year 2029 or something I can't remember exactly what his timeline still was time. still there, time there is still time um, but I think, yeah, the more realistic aspiration is to live long enough to live even longer. Because every year that you live, whether by diet, exercise, you know, some drug that hasn't been developed yet, is more time for scientists to develop more drugs. Sure. And if you can get to the point, and this is this is where you can start talking about at least the negligible senescence, biological form of immortality, there will still be buses to be hit by, there will still be future pandemics that can kill us. But if you can get to the point where science is advancing faster than you are ageing, then it's really hard to predict how long humans are going to live, and I would hate to be you know, drawn on that kind of number. Ah, oh, that was literally the question I was about to finish. I said I was going to say, no waffling, <laughs> just the number, no qualifications. Well, how old can humans live to? People may be familiar with the uh, the immensely bearded. Uh, this doesn't sound like a number, Andrew. This sounds like words. It sounds like well, there's going to be a number at the end of it. <laughs> okay. Don't worry. The immensely bearded Aubrey de Grey. Yeah. And he got in a lot of hot water in the early 2000s for predicting that humans could live to a thousand. Let oh, me tell wow. you the basis on which he made that calculation. It was, well, it's essentially a number that I've already given. It's that our chance of death as young adults is somewhere in the ballpark of one in a thousand per year. Most of, you know, some of that is cancer, some of that is heart disease, but most of that is, you know, particularly in young men, unfortunately, suicide. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, car accidents and that kind of thing. Mostly they're these external causes. Mm -hmm. And so if we eliminate all the internal causes, what you're left with is one in a thousand, an average of a thousand years. It's a long time, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've got no desire to be alive that long. I'm uh, ready to uh, shuffle off this mortal coil. But, uh, um, I mean, you're saying that biological causes of death could be eliminated. I don't think... I mean, there's there's no reason. Look at a tortoise. It, it is negligibly senescent. De death certificate... Have you, did you see what no, they, I haven't they recorded seen it. No. Uh, as cause of death? Old age. Oh, no. They I didn't realise that was still have, allowed. Yeah, it's still allowed. I, occasionally, we... we I don't when you just can't I identify don't anything. anymore, I'll get somebody else to do that. But um, uh, yeah, we can still put old age. Oh, no, and I, I think this is one of the great sort of misperceptions. I understand why that is a convenient shorthand, because at the end of the day, you don't think, want to... In, I think in the case of the Queen, it probably was the least controversial to go for. <laughs> That's they, true as well. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. don't want to like chalk her death up to anything, you know, to particularly you know, a member of the royal household. That would be very awkward, wouldn't it? Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah, <laughs> well, quite. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, 
we're not we don't need to do a full like we don't need to dissect every 90 year old who who dies but at the same time i think um we don't do enough investigation of causes of death in older people we don't really I, I, know yeah, i know what you mean what totally. kills a lot of 80 or 90 year olds and there's a really sorry we're, we're doing very badly wrapping this up aren't we there's this really fascinating series of studies done uh dissecting 80 90 there were some even done in what are called super centenarians so these are mm. people who make it to the age of over 110 yeah and wow. in that age group they found that perhaps the leading cause of death is something called transthyretin amyloid, which is this mm-hmm. kind of amyloid that builds up, uh, often strangles the heart, basically, and causes yep. heart failure, which isn't really a cause of death in, you know, n- normal old people, so to speak, you know, people who die in their 80s or 90s. And I think not looking at what causes death in older people is really leading to quite significant blind spots in terms of the aging biology, because we need to be looking a little bit further ahead in the sense that, you know, wouldn't it be tragic if we cure all the causes of aging and death up to 95, mm. but then we all get killed by transthyretin amyloid aged 96 to 100? Thank you very much, Andrew. It's been, uh, you know, a very absorbing, long conversation because it's been fascinating stuff. So yeah, thanks uh, for sticking around, anyone who's still here. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, uh, likewise, appreciate that. And uh, where can people catch you? Well, you can check out my YouTube channel. I'm uh, youtubecom slash Steele. You'll, you'll put a link in the description. Yeah, well oh, thanks, thanks. Um, you can also check out my book, which is Ageless, which you can find at ageless.link. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Stato. I'm on Instagram as at Andrew J. Steele. I'd, I'd like to keep all the handles different just to keep everyone on their toes. <laughs> just, yeah, just keep them guessing. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's, that sounds good. I'd love to see you there. Great. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye. Excellent. Oh, um, that was really good. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's so much fun to talk about. You know. That was some well-winged interviewing. Yeah, I mean, it, it helps that you know, I do actually find it quite interesting. So. Yeah. <laughs> um,